interrupt your regularly scheduled program to inform you that Claw Isle, home of House Celtigar, with their red sigil crab, has been taken. We will now feed it to you. Nah. <laughs> Uh. How weird is it to be wearing the Craghouse Crab Feeder mask and have a Craghouse Crab Feeder T-shirt? <laughs> it's like if you met Darth Vader out in public and he was wearing a Darth Vader T-shirt. <laughs> it's like wearing a shirt of himself. <laughs> Crabception. <laughs> yeah, Crabception. Uh, that was Aziz showing you a little sneak peek at uh, one of his outfits for Ice and Firecon. And another sneak peek right here is this cup. No, Aziz is not drinking a weird blue liquid. This is the Ooh. cups for Skelly Night. If you put it real close to the camera, we might be able to even see it. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. Nimble Dicks, Targaritaville, Skelly Night 2023. I designed these cups. We printed them. They're color changing. So that's just water. Yeah, and if you're water. going to Ice and Fire Con and you come to our party, you'll get one of these cups. And, uh, is just water what they drink in Targaritaville? Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, it's funny because he really, Crab Feeder really looks like he's wasting away again in Targaritaville. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope you like crabs because this one is heavily crab flavored, as you might be able to tell already. Not only is the crab a red one, the sigil of Hal Celtigar, but a solid chunk of info we get from them comes from none other than Dick Crab. So, crab source, crab spot. What about crab juice? No, yeah, crab juice. Well, I'll take the Mountain Dew. Uh, <laughs> that's because they claim dominion over Crack Claw Point. That's why it's relevant here, because you might say, well, Dick Crab lives on Crack Claw Point. What's that have to do with Claw Isle? Well, they are neighbors. Usually... The mainland dominates the small islands around it. But in this case, the small island is trying to t dominate the mainland, or at least this portion of it. Certainly not the whole of Westeros. House Celtigar is perhaps more powerful than they seem, but not so powerful as to take over the entire continent. Now, it's also not unusual for a noble or a king or any ruler type, any fan anyone with a fancy title like that, to claim dominion over something they don't fully have control over. That's We've seen that a lot of times. What is unusual, though, is the Valyrian heritage of House Celtigar, in that they are a relative minority as a house located on an island. Now, of course, a lot of the Valyrian houses ended up in Westeros ended up on, house on islands, but... How Celtigar's island is all unique and has its own special features. And as is always important with an island, where it's located is really important. That's going to come up big today. So this is a house that is not super well known, but fairly well known. You will know them well after this episode. You'll know that they're wealthy and good at hiding it. The first piece of evidence uh, for that is that you probably didn't know that. So it's because they did a good job at hiding it. Another is that they seem to be the house with the most... Masters of Coin to their name. Now, we don't have a full list of Masters of Coin, but of the list we have, House Celtigar pops up the most. Though not as renowned at sea like many other island houses, they are formidable in their own right, and they are excellent at knowing when to jump ship, an important nautical skill. They've, repained pow they've remained powerful, despite being on the losing side of major conflicts several times, partly because they knew when to jump ship and have reaped great rewards from the times that they were on the winning side. They're a great example of soft power, power behind the scenes of financial backers rather than the ones at the front wielding their swords and issuing commands, of the philosophy that wealth is best protected by not letting anyone know you have it in the first place. One of the best ways to conceal wealth is to not let people even know you've got it. We'll explain Real all that disease. and more. The bet one of the best one ways the to conceal wealth is to conceal your wealth. Is that what you just said? That is what I just said. Okay, uh, fair. That's you're you're not maybe. wrong. You are not wrong. <laughs> am I wrong? No. Right. <laughs> I'm not right. wrong. Wait, am I wrong? <laughs> we'll repl we'll explain all that and more. And all that and more. And all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros <laughs> Podcast.
Uh, yes, it's a repetitive episode today. You know. <laughs> you know, repetition is the key to comedy. What is? <laughs> repetition is the key to comedy. W- wait, I don't get what. Are you just being redundant <laughs> saying that over and over again? <laughs> so hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of History of Westeros podcast. We are happy to be here. We hope you're happy to be here. I don't know why you'd be listening if not, but... We're starting off hate a little watchers. extra silly. Yeah, hate watching. I guess hate watching is a thing. Or hate listening, I yeah. guess, if you're a bot. I hate listening, boy. That's, uh, that's even more obscure. But I suppose if there's hate watching, there's probably hate listening. How's it going, Sean? You got anything special in your beverage today? I see you got something special on your shirt. You've got an Atlanta shirt. Not Atlanta the city, but Atlanta the TV show, which is named after the city. One and the same. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of the top 10 shows of all time. I, I made a a top 10 all-time shows list recently in atlanta makes a cut yeah nice i agree with you on that honestly i do even if i say it but not begrudgingly but there was just a season that i was sour on but then they came back real strong so i think you're right a see a year ago i might not have agreed but i agree now nice <laughs> but even your sour is it was only a seven instead of a nine for that one season yeah. right yeah like- it was like that it was like that season yeah. was a seven and i expect nine ten quality out of it so i was extra disappointed but i watched plenty of seven so i shouldn't have- yeah anyways yeah i feel that when when something sets a high bar you know you it feels like a lot when it drops off even yeah if it's still good you know uh. I, I got that for sure. So, shout out to our friend Nina. Oh, actually, what what are you drinking? I heard talked about your shirt, but what you got in the cup there? We already uh, talked about what's in my cup. It is water, despite the strange look. <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's nothing too unique for me anyway. It's the naked berry drink, uh, raspberry no black cherry, uh, sparkling ice. Usually I have raspberry and uh, a bang strawberry bang, but. I can't find Bang anymore. What? Uh, the last two or three trips to the grocery store or the gas station, they haven't had Bang in stock. Oh. So they lost a two hundred and fifty million dollar lawsuit. Like two hundred fifty million dollars. Like, How much money it, uh, can it possibly have? Not, probably not that much. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Like they, it was like anti-competitive practices. Like I didn't read the whole thing, but it looked pretty bad. Oh. Um, mm. So that might be. <laughs> so that's well, it's, it's yeah. even worse if they're not selling their product anymore. Okay, well I'm gonna keep my eye out for a bunch of bang and try to bring them on the way up to Ice and Firecon because this is worth me saying. If you've always wanted to try a Sean concoction at our uh, History of Westeros uh, Radio Westeros meet. Sean will have Sean's drink bar in the back, and you can get, uh, you can get a, a Sean concoction, non-alcoholic drink. Uh, mix it yourself, or he'll mix it for you. Sean can say more. There are plenty of bang substitutions. You can use Mountain Dew or Red Bull or whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so all the different things Sean would have as an option will be there for you to choose. Yes. We'll report on it afterwards for those of you who can't make it. Yeah, we'll also be giving out some stickers and uh, some other cool stuff. So Yeah. And shout out to our good friend Nina. Her notes are in this episode, as per usual, on her blog, goodqueenally.tumblr.com. That's one uh, L in Alley. I almost said one Y, which was <laughs> like, well, yeah, there's only one Y. <laughs> of course there's only one Y. She has a follow-up post on the Sansa and Serena marriage business during the time of Krieg and Stark, relevant to our episode a couple weeks ago, as well as a post on Kiera of Tyrosh comparing her to Catherine of Aragon. There's a lot of similarities and parallels. They are probably intentional. You'll want to read the blog post to hear Nina's specific takes on that. Next week. We have Joe Magician. We did something fun. We often have votes carried out by our patrons via poll, and that selects the episode topic. We usually don't have a poll when we have a guest. We usually decide on a topic with them and then settle that. But this time, we had a poll for what topic to discuss with Joe Magician. Now, this was heavily influenced by a certain piece of news that most of you probably have heard by now. It is, as of today... April 16th, 2023, and the Duncan Egg slash A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms is the official title. Uh, well, it doesn't have an official title. They're not going to call it Duncan Egg. That's a nickname that we all have gotten very used to, but they're not going to call it that. <laughs> but that does tell you what I'm talking about. Yes, Duncan Egg, whatever it's going to be called, The Hedge Knight, A Knight of Seven Kingdoms has been picked up by HBO. It's not a pilot order. It's a straight-to-series order. Like House of the Dragon, there is no kind of 
no, oh, this won't get made after all. I mean, that could always happen. You never know production things can change. But this is, as far as we know, HBO has confirmed it. It's been ordered. Contracts are done. I mean, there's no actors or or set locations or anything like that yet. It's very new. But there's a writer. There's, a, there's producers. And there's all that stuff. So, you know, fun. the one thing for that series... I love they're making it. I want it so bad. But the one thing I wanted them to do, because I think it clears up a lot of potential problems, is make it animated. Because yeah. it's going to be so hard to cast it. And even if they do find someone to fit the roles of Dunk and Egg, how are they going to like pace that out over, you know, if they have a season a year even, they're, they're going to grow up? I don't know. So a- making it animated not only alleviates a lot of budget concerns, but casting concerns and the kids growing up and stuff like that. I agree. Has that been clarified? It's, whether or it's, it's, it's going to be live action. Yes, it's live action. It is yeah. okay. Yeah. So that unfor- I see. I, <laughs> I see. I see what you're saying there. That doesn't mean it's not going to be able to do those things well. You're saying animated would make those things easier. That doesn't mean they can't do it well though. Yeah. One yeah. thing we do know is that it will be six episodes, which makes sense. And one time, you, on one hand, that might be disappointing that it's not longer. On the other hand, it's like, well, ten episodes covered season one of Game of Thrones. Ten episodes covered season one of House of the Dragon. Six episodes for just the hedge knight is actually a lot yeah because game of thrones is 900 ish pages yeah and the hedge knight is 150 ish no, pages it's more than that it's more like 300 but it's still a lot shorter okay it's still a lot shorter. even yeah so yeah it, 300 is about a third but we're getting two-thirds of the episode right not once so yeah with a yeah. vastly smaller cast of characters too i mean so you have way more time to spend with those characters you're probably not gonna be jumping around at different locations as much which to be fair house of the dragon doesn't even do that a lot but it does it's probably does it more than than H- H- hedge knight will and certainly more less than game of thrones jumped around want- a ton you know i wonder if it'll be like you know 40 minute episode instead of hour long that's entirely possible. or maybe a- Maybe it'll be way more cinematic. They'll spend much more time on yeah. broad shots and music and you know reflecting characters and stuff. You know. Well, this is a preview of what we're going to talk about with Joe Magician. We're going to talk about not just what's going to happen in our dreams. It's called Dreams of Duncan Egg. It's, it's a multi-meaning title. We're going to discuss like this kind of stuff that, that Sean and I and, and Ashe are, are talking about, like what we imagine will be there. But also some of the dreams that Duncan Egg have had during the series as perhaps foreshadowing and just to discuss those with another person. I want to talk mix. about my tease for what I want to talk about is that in George's blog post, how he talked about writing that Dornish adventure. Oh yeah. Uh, like, yeah. like it just changed maybe his ideas on what dunks and Duncan eggs could happen, I guess. And I Good really point. want more Tansel too tall. And, He's hinted we'd see more of her, so I'm excited to talk about that as well. That is a great point, yeah, because not some of the things that happen off page and Duncan Egg might actually be on screen, which is you kind of the opposite of what you expect. You expect like, well, they can't do everything. Well, with six episodes on the head, maybe they can. They can do, do extra. extra. Yeah, they so, might, yeah, we yeah. might see when they, I never. I didn't actually think about it like that either. That we might see when they went to Dorn. I thought that's what he was hinting at. Yeah, to me, post. I thought he was saying he was going to write like a different, another like a Dornish adventure for them, but not that specific. Uh, yeah. Past, I didn't think he was be going, but would be going back in time for Duncan Egg. I guess. Okay. Yeah. But, maybe uh, maybe they will for the TV show, but not for not. Yeah, for, for the TV the show, I think yeah. that makes perfect sense. But yeah, I think he was saying that he was thinking he would do more and draw. I don't know. Anyways, we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, that is a, a preview for next week. We'll have Joe Magician here for that. It'll be great, and um, we'll get you nicely covered. Get everything we can. Hopefully, there'll be some more news in the meantime. If this episode ends and you want to stay immersed. We've got you covered with suggestions for topics related to this one at the end. Just like the answer to this trivia question, which will also be at the end. The question is, who created the title Grand Admiral? Bonus question, who currently holds that title? Uh, I've, of course, been thinking about Grand Admirals because of Star Wars lately. (laughs) Grand at where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? Well, it's not. Thrawn is not the answer to this question, but mm, he was the inspiration. Super chat from Koi Venazi. Can't wait to see you all in less than two weeks. Same here, my man. It's going to be great. I hope to see a lot of the rest of you as well. Koi also said in the chat just now, I'm hoping to share my Dunkin' Egg poem at the con in two weeks. A poem? Yeah, Koi did a poem last year, if you remember as I well. do. It was good. Um, it was, so I'm excited for a Dunkin' Egg one. Heck yeah. Um, that's That's exciting. All right, let's get going. First mention, as we often do, we discuss the first mention of the topic. The actual technical first mention of how Celtigar is in the appendix of book one, but they appear in the prologue of Clash of Kings, kicking it off right as Stannis is introduced. Quote, You mock me with a king's style. 
Yet, what am I king of? Dragonstone and a few rocks in the narrow sea, there is my kingdom. He descended the steps of his chair to stand before the table, his shadow falling across the mouth of the Blackwater Rush and the painted forest where King's Landing now stood. There he stood, brooding over the realm he sought to claim, so near at hand, and yet so far away. Tonight I am to sup with my lord's bannermen, such as they are, Keltigar, Valarian, bar Emin, the whole paltry lot of them, a poor crop, if truth be told, but they are what my brothers have, let me, have left me. That Lycene pirate Salador San will be there with the latest tally of what I owe him, and Morash the Meerman will caution me with talk of tides and autumn gales, while Lord Sunglass mutters piously of the will of the Seven. Keltigar will want to know which storm lords are joining us. Valarian will threaten to take his levies home unless we strike at once. What am I to tell them? What must I do now? To us, for the purpose of this episode, Stannis is a model for all the lords of Dragonstone, which means a lot of Targaryens. In other words, he's taking the role, the place of what they might have been saying, especially prior to the conquest, looking back at the mainland and what their lords of the narrow sea might be pushing on them or expecting from them. By the way, that moment where Stannis' shadow passes over the mouth of Blackwater Bay, that's a really cool symbolic, symbolic moment. But also, it's interesting to point to the geography here. And something I'm just now catching as we're doing this live. If you were to look at the map, how Celtigar is in this region for sure, but the but Claw Isle would probably fall outside of that shadow, which I think is kind of important considering the, the picture that we're looking at here. Because how Celtigar is metaphorically involved in a lot of things, but they're not, but they're at a distance. Their involvement is maybe has a layer in between it. Like I said at the beginning, they're not the necessarily the guys in the front issuing commands, waving swords around, but they have a lot of power. And a lot of that's through wealth. And a lot of that is exactly because of where their island is, not just specifically in relation to the continent, but where it is in relation to a lot of the other regions. We'll explain as we go. Nina points out it's unclear throughout the history of the Targaryen kingdom in Westeros whether the princes of Dragonstone had real feudal power in the Narrow Sea as we see Stannis has as Lord of Dragonstone. In other words, how much were the early lords of Dragonstone before they were the princes of Dragonstone? How much were they issuing commands to the other lords of the Narrow Sea and how much of those commands were being followed? Celtigar and Valarian were probably following. They had been with them for so long. But Valarian were more sure about. Claw Isle, a little bit farther away. They might have been able to go their own way on some things. Probably not too much. They don't want a dragon coming after them. Uh, but there's also the ethnic connection between them. That's one thing I wanted to clarify. Do we know how long the Celticars have been on Claw Isle? Would, did they come over in the wake of the Doom, or were they already there before that? They were there in the wake. They were there already, like the Valarians and... Targaryens were. It's not clear what order. Because remember, we're, we're told the Valarians got there before the Targaryens. We're not told if it was a long time before, or maybe they just got there a little bit before as Targaryens told them to go first. And we're like, yeah, we'll go get that settled. We'll meet you there, that kind of thing. Or if they took it upon themselves to establish a base. That's unclear. Claw Isle is basically the same deal. We don't know. We just know it was before the Doom, because no one escaped the Doom. Like, no one really got, got it. It was so sudden and quick. Uh, so they were there probably a good hundred years before at least, but maybe more than that, maybe 110, maybe 120, I, maybe a little less though, but probably about the same as the Targaryens. I, I realized as I was asking that, that I knew that they were there before the doom, but I guess I was asking, were they there for, you know, a few generations or a few centuries yeah. before the doom? And I guess we don't really know. Huh? Yeah. It's probably best guess is probably right about the same as the Targaryens. So, so about 110, 100 years, but it could be a little longer. Yeah, it could it could be shorter, but that seems unlikely. It seems like if the, when the Targaryens went, they would have gone with them and not come a little later. But maybe they could have. There's, you know, George could come up with a reason why if he wanted to. It wouldn't be that difficult. Uh, it just takes a little imagination. One other quick question that I don't think we cover later on. I don't remember coming across it in my research. Do we know the name of their, their seat, their castle? No, great question. We do not. We do not know the name of the castle on Claw Isle. I was going to point that out at some point, but we may as well say it now. We don't know the name of it. We, there must be a port 
they have ships. And so that, that might have a separate name, as a lot of these places do. That's that's not uncommon in Westeros. We have a lot of these a lot of these places are kind of unnamed or unreferred to. There's been no reason to bring it up at this point. We haven't gone to Claw Isle. They just call it Claw Isle. Um, maybe it's just <clears throat> Castle Claw Isle or <laughs> Castle Crab. I don't know. Red crab. Their, their sigil is a crab, right? Yeah. A red crab on a white background. Well, a bunch of red crabs, but yeah, same difference. Okay. And, but but uh, they don't have house words that we know of either, right? I think Nina had a head cannon. Yeah, they do not have words. known house words. Nina's got a really good one. She says, uh, "All within our grasp," I believe it is. Um, yeah, all in our grasp, not within. All in our grasp. And Nina does that. She's has done a good job of making up some house words for houses that don't have them. You know, using thing qualities that that house possesses or attitudes they've shown in the past. And yeah, she does a good job of that. They fill in nicely until we get the real ones. We may never get the real ones, so they may fill in forever. <laughs> also, just as a side note, who is this Morosh the Mirror Man that, that's mentioned in this quote? That name, I don't think, ever comes up again. <laughs> I guess he's, <laughs> he he's probably just dies off page and doesn't get mentioned. <clears throat> Maybe in the Blackwater battle. <laughs> a lot of people died there, so that would make sense. Yeah, he was he was right to caution him, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he still cautioned me with talk of tides and autumn gales and like, uh, should have cautioned him about wildfire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lord Sunglass mutters piously about the will of the seven, and he was burned. So, hmm, yeah. <laughs> so Hal Celtigar also, in, in addition to showing how a great example of soft power and how being close to the people in power can really pay off, but we show... They also become a model for how duty can be stretched when times are tough. One of the few crucially important ethical slash philosophical debates between Stannis and Davos and Melisandre and a few others comes up. Uh, you may r remember what I'm referring to, a br brief preview. That is when Sir Axel says, hey, things are going bad, but what if we go loot Claw Isle <laughs> and then profit? Yeah, so that's an important uh, moment we'll get to here in just a few minutes. First of all, a little geography. Like I said, they're a little similar to House Valarian in many ways, though, of course, lesser status. But it may not have always been so. We don't know that House Celtigar was beneath House Valarian in acclaim, even in the times of being in Valyria. For all we know, House Celtigar was more important, and they just lost a lot of wealth in the Doom, and Valarians were able to rebuild quickly because they had more ships or something like that. They may have had more of their investments in land-based industries or something. You know, wealthy people have their money all over the place. And when an entire continent goes down, you never know who <laughs> stands to lose the most. But you just know that plenty of people lost a lot, the, apart from their lives, of course. So there's a lot of details to be revealed here. Like Sean brought up, we don't know the name of the castle. We don't know the name of... You know, what time they got there, you know, whether it was noon or no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what, what year they got there. I mean, but we do have a, quite a lot to deal with, quite a lot we can extrapolate. Let's start with a basic quote here that gets us started. Dragonstone had been the westernmost outpost of Valyrian power for two centuries. Its, loca its location athwart the gullet gave its lords a stranglehold on Blackwater Bay, enabled both the Targaryens and their close allies the Valarians of Driftmark, a lesser house of Valyrian descent, to fill their coffers off the passing trade. Valarian ships, along with those of another allied Valyrian house, the Celtigars of Claw Isle, dominated the middle reaches of the Narrow Sea, whilst the Targaryens ruled the skies with their dragons. A question we asked about both Dragonstone and Driftmark, and really we could ask about just about any island that was settled at some point, but the question is bigger when the settling comes more recently, is who was there when these people landed? When the Valyrians came to Claw Isle, or Driftmark or Dragonstone, who was already there, and what happened to those people? It's a perhaps a much more interesting question with the Celtigars, because Claw Isle is a lot closer to the mainland than... Dragonstone or Driftmark. And the reason that matters is because ancient peoples could have gotten to Claw Isle on probably rudimentary rafts and crafts and boats. You wouldn't need something that's like a, a really well made ship to get to it. It's probably visible from the shore. It doesn't mean it's super close, it doesn't mean it's easy, but we're talking like 
not necessarily English channel length, but probably something like that where you could see across and see the island. I'm sort of guessing because I don't know for sure. But based on the map, it's very close and it seems like a safe guess. So there were probably people there. Unlike Driftmark and Dragonstone, there may not have been much people there. There's probably some First Men style people on Claw Isle that had to be dealt with. Maybe some local lord that had to be overthrown. From the Celtigar's point of view, this might have been fairly easy. Because one thing about these old First Men enclaves is they don't really work well together. They're all very insular and uh, isolated, maybe a little like the Fens, where they kind of have their own thing going, and they don't really aren't heavily influenced by outside culture, and ev all the things they do are ingrained, and have been they've been doing it that way for that long. So they don't work with each other very well. So if it's not the case of they come in and start attacking, and the other clans like gang up on them to keep the invaders out, especially not when we're talking about an island that's the mainland. People aren't even aren't going to do that. They're definitely not going to help the Islanders, right? They're probably not even aware this is happening until it's too late. Yeah. Even if they wanted to, they don't know what's happening or it takes too long to get there, et cetera. The reason why I suspect these are first manish and not say Andals, it, you'd say, well, why didn't the Andal, why wouldn't it be Andals? Didn't Andals overrun pretty much everywhere? Yes and no. They, they overran most places. They did not overrun Crackclaw Point. They were never able to conquer Crackclaw Point. It's one of the places where they gave up trying to conquer and just started marrying instead. So yes, there's Andal blood in there in the nobility, but most of the common folk are first men blood most, like, almost entirely. There's not a lot of intermarriage on the social level, on the uh, common folk level. And that the terrain and geography of the place, as Dick Crab shows when he's walking through there with Brienne, it doesn't it's not very wide open. It's, it is very close. It's like a rural area that doesn't have a lot of development. It's also poor, so there's not a lot of reason for outsiders to come there and make their fortune. There's not much fortune to be made. So it's just kind of stayed that way for a long time. So it's pretty interesting to think about that and how that relates to what Claw, well, what's going on at Claw Isle. It's probably kind of similar. You may have some bogs and swamps and thick forests there. And the Celtigars may have adopted bits and pieces of that. We see that a lot. Like Aegon the Conqueror, he takes over Westeros, he adopts the religion of most of Westeros to facilitate his rule. Celtigars probably took on a few local customs too when they moved in to try to make it a little easier to accept their rule. Things like that. Putting crabs on their flat on their sigil for one thing. Like they didn't have they didn't even have a sigil. It back was a in real Valeria. we're crab people now. <laughs> D. That's, yeah, that's, that's really total. Was how that's happened. real. We're crab people now. Energy. Yeah. You're totally right. Yeah. <laughs> so, talk about trying to fit in. So we eat the local food. It's the local animals. The mascot. Hey, see, we're just like you. <laughs> just because we have silver hair doesn't mean we don't like good red crabs. Uh -huh. So the name Claw Isle, I guess, comes from the fact that it just sits right off Crack Claw Point. And there's a claw. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, really. But there's probably crabs there. <laughs> and uh, we can only guess beyond that, like what size the castle is. It doesn't sound like it's a very big castle, given Sir Axel's plan to overrun it. On the other hand, part of the part of their idea is that it's lightly garrisoned. And Davos is like, yeah, it's lightly garrisoned because he sent all his troops to fight for you and they died. Come on, <laughs> you know? So that's, uh, yeah, Axel's argument kind of sucks. But the point is, even though his argument sucks, there's, it tells us a lot about the situation here. We can make a lot of guesses and a lot of extrapolations. One thing Dick Crabb says is that the Celticars try to send tax collectors into Crackclaw Point. And some of them come back. <laughs> 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 what that says to me is this is a this is a lordship that has not really concerned about either the people they're taxing or the lives of their tax collectors. They're just like <laughs> those the, the drug cartels that try to send packages with unknowing mules or just uh, attach them to cars or like some of these will get through and the ones we lose we don't care because we make so much money on the ones that get through that's what the crack that's what these tax collectors are doing it's like well some of these tax collectors will bring back cash if they die oh well we'll hire new tax collectors you know it's just, so it's very uh dehumanizing like they don't see this is a lot of wealth comes first over humanity 
And I think we're going to see more and more of that the more we go through this episode. I'm not going to paint a great picture of how Celtigar is good people. They're not necessarily bad people, but all this wealth hoarding and soft power isn't going to leave a good taste in your mouth as far as them as having a strong ethical history. But that's not abnormal for these big, noble, powerful houses anyway. The founder... By the way, in my head, Canon. All those tax collectors that don't come back didn't necessarily get killed by the people of Crack Claw Point. They might have just been like, well, I guess I'm retiring now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they picked up a bunch of taxes and just took the heck and got on the next ship out of there like Aria. <laughs> or even uh, didn't want to risk being killed and just join the Crack Claw Point people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, too. The founder of House Celtigar is a familiar name. You know, you'll you'll recognize this the style of this name. It's Celtigarth Greenhand. Uh -huh. That's not true. <laughs> that's, that's a false <laughs> okay, fact. I made that up. Fake news disease. Yeah. What's not fake news is that I <laughs> am running a poll in the live stream chat. How do you pronounce Celtigar? Uh, after people asked me to run the poll, I did that. And would you believe that it's really head and head? 42% of people say Celtigar. 36% say Celtigar. 23%, myself included, say Bull. Mm. Can I, uh, I? I did some research that might be insightful here. Um, so Celtic in real world, you know, European people, uh, was the way it was pronounced for, I don't know, hundreds of years. But it came from a Greek word called Keltoid, spelled oh, with a K. Keltoid. But through, like, just language translations between, like, you know, German and French, Latin or whatever, just sometimes the one person would say it some way, and then someone in another language would write it down, but with their letters, but then someone else would pronounce mm -hmm. those letters a different way, uh, and it just turned into a, a, an S sound spelled with the C. Drift. Phonetically, by all rules... It should be pronounced S. But in the past hundred years or so, scholars, academic historians have decided it's probably more historically correct to call the, that European people's Celts mm. instead of Celts. But it's still phonetically correct to say it with an S sound. And and even academics who want to call them Celts still would call the Boston Celtics or rugby or soccer team still pronounce it with an S. So it, it, apparently it is correct to call the European peoples Celts, not Celts. Mm. But that archaic translation error from a Greek word is not the case in George R. R. Martin's world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that that's where it came from. Now, maybe George was thinking about the real world Celts when he wrote it. Who knows? But uh, I feel like Given the reason they it has shifted from Celts to Celts in our world, that doesn't apply to George's world, and so it should be Celticar. That's my thought. But also, I think it could be both, for sure. Yeah. I say both, and I am actually very curious to see if I can find like a, a recording of George reading a chapter where he says mm -hmm. it. I would be uh, very curious, and I particularly liked uh, Bloody ben, ben Blackwood in the chat's quip where he said, how does Roy Dotree say it? Because then, Celtigar, yeah. then we know the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> the TV so show also wrong. says Celtigar. <laughs> Some people would also say, well, that's also wrong because it's the TV show. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, anyways, I, I will say the, the votes have not drastically changed one way or another after this, this brief <laughs> discussion. I don't know that anyone's being swayed. I made the decision to say it Celtigar in my quotes, and I can still say Celtigar if I'm saying it myself my my quotes my, my in the world i'm saying a celtigar and i'm i think if it. you say a celtigar then you have to call uh tywin's daughter cursey <laughs> <laughs> i would like to i would like to curse you, <laughs> well can we say so, maybe it comes from like cell like the the winnie the pooh character cell tigger oh mm. oh yeah. yes no mm. cell tiger by the way if I could continue on this a little bit, because I some my research kind of dipped into something that might relate to the, the Celts in the real world, the Celticars in George's world, that they were actually massively spread across Europe in like, you know, I don't know, 500-ish yeah. BCE. They spread from basically Germany, you know, was it called Germany at that time? But that that's basic geographic location 
They went all across from Spain to Turkey through all of England and the British Isles, all across. But then as Rome conquered through Europe, they destroyed or, or assimilated all those cultures all the way up into England. They, they Romanized them, you know, and, and part of why the, the Latin uh, pronunciation took over or whatever. But the far, far reaches, Ireland, Welsh, you know, like that the far range. quite that far. <laughs> yeah, they, they held on to that uh, Celt tradition, language. And that's pro- why it's still around today, probably. Might have gotten wiped out other, yeah. other than that, right? Yeah. and But that made me think a little bit about the Celticars in this world is it? I wonder if they were at least part of the Valerians who were much more widespread and powerful, yeah. but this one little remnant to the far reaches made it, instead made of, it through. Instead of Rome their... conquering them, they blew up thanks to the doom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a similar thing though, right? <laughs> yeah. And I wonder if you can look at them like the, the, if you look at them as Celts, like their ethnic makeup, there's a little bit of similarity there. They're known for being, you know, like light haired and, and blue green eyed, which it's a little bit like Valeria. You got the lighter hair. It's more platinum and gold. It's a little more fantasized, but and purple. But the purple and blues and greens are still there. You know, it's 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 similar-ish. But that's similar to the Vandals and the Andals, which are also the tall, blonde, blue-eyed invaders, which is maybe a little more on the nose for Westeros. Anyway, like I said, it's uh, according to a, a one-liner quote. It's it's a few hours sail from Dragonstone. Claw Isle is the ancient sea girt house of House Celtigar. It's not very large, but again, it's positioned extremely importantly. Let's recall this gem from A Storm of Swords, Davos 4. Sir Axel proposed to use Salador San's fleet and the men who had escaped the Blackwater. Stannis, Stannis still had some 1,500 on Dragonstone, more than half of them Florence, to exact retribution for Lord Keltigar's defection. Claw Isle was but lightly garrisoned, its castle reputedly stuffed with mirish carpets, volantine glass, gold and silver plate, jeweled cups, magnificent hawks, an axe of Valyrian steel, a horn that could summon monsters from the deep, chests of rubies, and more wines than a man could drink in a hundred years. Mm. That is quite a list. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Which one are you? Which one do you want most? It's the axe. Well, no, I'll take the chest of rubies. I mean. By the way, I was going to say commas are important because depending on how you read that, a horn that could summon monsters from the deep chests of rubies. Yes, it's very important. (laughs) Those would be very small rubies, very small monsters. But those those would be the worst ones. Like like little Maybe it's a really big chest. Oh, and then that's even more terrifying. then. (laughs) Uh, it says we have to use our standard uh, gender technicality here. So more minds, more wines than a man could drink in a hundred years, eh? But not a woman. Mm, a woman could mm. drink it in fifty. Yeah, Cersei. Could Cersei. Definitely Cersei. Drink. Sorry, you mean Kirky? Cersei, you're Kirky. 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 Yes. Oh, so wait, this is Slaw Isle, then, isn't it? Well, that yeah, that was a joke. People said that Keltigar of Claw Isle sounded better than Celtigar of Slaw Isle. <laughs> So, yeah. I do not want to go to Slaw Isle. Do you not like <laughs> coleslaw? Sounds... I don't. I don't. So that would be Soul Soul Claw, not <laughs> coleslaw. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not a big fan of coleslaw. Mm, what about hot yeah. slaw? I'm not a big fan of cabbage. <laughs> what about Sean hot like slaw, cabbage. coleslaw. Hot slaw. Hot slaw. Ugh. Still no. Is that sauerkraut? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just making it up. That's the whole, that's the monster that this horn can summon. <laughs> It summons awful coleslaw oh, from the deep. Oh, Nina says Keltigar, and that she says it in the chat just now. So right, so right now where it's split gender wise, technically, <laughs> if I'm saying the women Keltigar. say Keltigar, the men say Celtigar. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's funny. As long as Nina also says Kirky. If you're, <laughs> how do you reverse words that are like like the word chest? How do you switch the S and the C there? It's like shek, chest, shekst, yeah, shekt. Anyway. <laughs> so that horn is really cool. We've discussed it elsewhere, uh, pr- predominantly, I think, in the Dragon Binder episode. Other things that horn, other horns, you know, magical horns. And it, I believe we also brought it up in our Will Uran, Will Uran, Will Uran Summon Krakens episode that we wrote for Robert in Deep Geek. The axe, of course, we've also talked about elsewhere. It's a s- huge sign of their maintained wealth. I like to look at it slightly symbolically. The Targaryens have lost most of their crowns, particularly Aegon's crown, which is the Valyrian steel one. 
They lost both of their swords, although they kind of gave those away. Kind of gave them away, kind of lost them. The throne isn't made of Lyrian steel, but they lost that too. <laughs> so, but Claw Isle endures. They've held on all this wealth, this Valyrian steel axe that they've had almost certainly since before the Doom. Like, this is probably something they brought over with them. They still have it, unlike the, the Valyrians and the Targaryens have had these crazy shifts of power up and down, and rise and fall, but the Celtigar seem to be just... have... We don't know of any giant reset for them, other than the Doom, which was, you know, probably hurt them less than... Well, it did hurt them less than most Valyrian houses. They were one of the few to escape it. So, there's that. I will say, I think that... They still have this wealth, but who knows how much wealth they also lost. Yeah, absolutely. They might have not been hurt as bad as other Valerians, but they still might have been hurt pretty yeah, bad. Absolutely. That was a thought that I had is that if, if their money, you even suggested it might have been tied up in investments. Like they might have like built a shipyard in a port in Valeria. Yeah. And we're reaping the benefits from that. But all of a sudden that shipyard was destroyed and lost and missing. So the, the engineers they had sent, the money they had sent, the lumber they had sent, all that suddenly just evaporated. Yeah. Like it or, would be a, a big loss for them. Or which might even be more likely. I think what you're saying is very, very believable. If they were c confident the doom was going to happen, they would have withdrawn whatever they could have. But there'd still be things that they couldn't take out. For example, like any trade yeah. deal they have, they might not just abandon yeah. that just because, well, we don't know when the doom is going to happen. It might be another 10 years from now. But what if they had lent money to people? That's when I think that that's just a sunk cost. You lend yeah. money to people. You can't make them leave Valyria. Like, dude, you guys need to leave. Mm -hmm. Not because we care about your lives, but because you owe us money. <laughs> it's like, no, really? The whole thing's going to blow up. Yeah, sure. The whole thing's going to blow up. Sure, Celtigars. How are we going to pay <laughs> you back if we leave our business and set up shop in a whole other continent? Like, how are we going to do that? But you're definitely not going to pay us back if you explode. Well, yeah. So that probably did happen. That's a great point. Uh, another funny thing about their axe, like, one of the reasons Blackfire became such a big deal is Aegon IV made it a big deal. It wasn't this big symbol of Targaryen rulership until he made it that. It hadn't been that big a deal for the first 180 years of Targaryen rule. It was important, but it wasn't like, he who holds the sword has the kingdom. That sentiment didn't exist at all until some people just started making that up. So the Celticars were smart enough not to be like, he who holds this axe rules Claw Isle, because <laughs> that just causes civil wars and all sorts of other bad outcomes. Yeah, it's much better to stick with whoever my firstborn son is. Claw Isle. That's <laughs> that's it. much smarter. Yes, <laughs> I bet that axe could really cleave a crab shell cleanly. Just woof, right there. Mm. That crab never knew what hit it. I, I do believe the Chests of Rubies comment. I think that it's probably somewhat accurate. It might be a little exaggerated, but as we'll see throughout this episode, the Celtigars have had an enormous am amount of opportunity over an enormous amount of time without any obvious full setbacks. Like, yeah, the Doom, there would have been setbacks, but nothing that's, like, completely wiped them out that they have to rebuild Theory. from scratch. Is it possible, Aziz, that the Chests of Rubies are just chests of crab shell? <laughs> <laughs> Ruby red crabs. <laughs> It's possible. They are red. Like you said, they're red. It's suspicious that they are red crabs. <laughs> I'm joking. Nina has a great take here. Thinking of chests and rubies makes you think of Rhaegar and the chest where his rubies were implanted on his breastplate and how those blew out. And Nina says it could be a little bit of an in-joke there on how those, you know, those chests, those rubies flew away when Robert smashed him, but these rubies that the Tar Celtigars have still holding on to are an indication of where their loyalty lies. They're still loyal to the tar their heritage and the Targaryens. I, I had that same thought too, that I wonder if they mean that when they say that they really mean that we, we still have a chest of rubies means that we are still loyal to the Targaryens. Mm -hmm. And especially because I seem to remember Dick Crab making that comment. Well, I think it was Dick Crab, right? Didn't he say something to We're the effect of like, man, yes. we, yeah, we still, you know, I guess we kind of have to go along with this, but we really have our loyalty to the Targaryens. Yeah. Cause Visenya went and presented and went there on in person and they, took that as an honor, kind of like Stannis going to meet personally with the Hill Clans in the North. And that has lasted. Even to this day, 300 years later, they're like, yeah, we're good dragon men up here. And that's because of Visenya's visit. Like, they were like, yes, Visenya, Celtigar's attempts to take them over were like, eh, reject, reject. But when Visenya came, they were like, oh, 
you know, visit from the queen on her dragon and, you know, f- meeting us face to face rather than just trying to claim dominion. That's that's more honorable, more like it's more real and more personal. Yeah, it's it's not treating us as equals, but it's treating us as closer to treating equal. us with respect. Yeah, it is. You know? Yeah, exactly. So you can see why that went better and why that worked out more. And so that's that's, of course, very relevant for them showing not just loyalty to a dragon but to a female dragon which might be relevant when it comes time to Aegon and Daenerys which is going to be relevant for the Celticars which side will they take in this will they sign up for team Aegon and then go oh wait here come real dragons let's go with that instead so this they're a real important potential ally for one or both of the dragon uh factions here and their significant wealth which we will continue to describe could make a big difference for whichever side they invest that in or both. If they start with one and then move to the other, let's talk about why their location is so important. I call it a gateway point. The tight space relatively between claw Isle and the mainland allows them to keep control of that channel. Again, I compared it a little bit to the English channel. There's no naval competition from crack claw itself. When the controlling the English channel is difficult because you need to control, bo- or any channel is difficult, because you need to control both sides of it. If one side controls, if some other party or nation controls the other side, well, then their taxes, their ships are going to be collecting taxes on closer to their shores, and yours, maybe you're controlling your side, but where does your side begin and their side end, and things like that, all sorts of difficulties. But the people of Cracklaw Point aren't really naval people. They're not really outward facing at all, let alone taking the ships, so... There's no one on Crackclaw Point set up with a port or ships or navies to collect taxes from ships passing through. That's all the Celtigar. They get all that. So that's, like Nina's words, all in our grasp. <laughs> it works out pretty well there. All in their grasp of their claws. Uh, so it's a great spot for them. No one's, in com- no one's competing for them for this traffic. And if you look at the map, it becomes pretty clear. They're at the northernmost part of the Crown Lands. Right off the tip of Crackclaw Point, any ship coming from the north, whether it's from the north-north, whether it's from the Vale, whether it's from Bravos, if they're coming along the coast to hit to King's Landing, they're going to have to pass through this narrow channel unless they want to take the long way. Here's what I would do if I were the Lord of Crackclaw Point. I would find out what the wages, the average wages for a sailor in Westeros or Bravos or someone else is, get a rough count on how many sailors will be on any given ship that's passing and say okay you want to pass by here you have to pay x amount where x equals roughly three days of wages for their sailors because there's like if you want to go around the long way that's how many extra days wages you got to pay your sailors so charge them just a little less than that and they're like all right (laughs) so it would take me four days to go around but i got to pay you three days worth all right well that's cheaper so i'll pay you three days or even three and a half days or something like that so that that's what i would do if i were the lord of claw isle and i was trying to collect my tolls so you can think of them kind of like the, the the phrase right they're collecting all this money just on every single person that's got any money that's passing by <laughs> You get a little bit of that. You know, you check their cargo, you set up shop. Now, different lords of Celtigar, different ladies m- would have handled this differently. Some of them would have been like, just go. You know, I don't care. Some of them would have taken just a, a token amount. Some of them would have tried to charge more than that, you know, that uh, calculation I came up with basing it on how much the, the, the wages are being paid. There's lots of ways to do it, you know. One effect of that would be, or, or you know, several potential effects of that that are almost all negative is it, they pay the sailors less. Yeah, that could be right? something else. Or yeah. they just don't go that way. Some trade that was happening stops happening. Yep. And some of those things might be worth it if they use those tariffs or taxes or whatever you want to call them to build lighthouses and, you know, provide, you know, improve the ports and yeah. and spread, you know, marketing information about these different sailors or all this stuff. But if they just like stick it in their vault and buy themselves nicer clothes and it doesn't actually help the sailors or the merchants in any way, it's just like dragging down society to do it's that. You know? so, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I'm throwing a wide range out here because I imagine there are some Lords of Claw Isle that did the sort of thing you're describing. They would make the port nicer. Give give them an incentive to come there. Trade your goods there. Not just pass through and pay a toll. Stop off there. Sell some of your goods that you got in Essos 
along the way or that you got it from the north and you get those before king's landing gets them because they're on the way to king's landing you have and that think mm -hmm. about that in terms of news not just goods you get news from bravos before king's landing gets it if they're stopping in your port but if they're not stopping in your port yeah. then you're not getting that uh, so it just depends. Yeah, it's gonna, a lot's going to depend on the, the the values, the disposition of this particular Lord of Claw Isle. A good example of this in the series is when Marcella's ship heads for Bravos. Remember, Tyrion sends Marcella and Tom and or sends Marcella away to protect her from whatever may come. And of course, it's a lie. She's actually going to Dorne, but they pretend to send her to uh, send her north. Right. So the orders are to stay as close as possible to the shore to be as far away from Dragonstone as possible, which means they're going to pass Crack, uh, Cracklaw Point through Claw Isle and then veer off to go to Bravos, then cut across the Narrow Sea to go north. So the things I said about passing Claw Isle are not going to apply to anything from the south, right? Like they're not going to, if you're coming from Estremont or Sunspear or all the way around from Old Town looping around the continent, you wouldn't pass Claw Isle on your way to King's Landing. You would go up the coast and then hit King's Landing and then probably just go back south. You may you may have no reason to go to Claw Isle at all. So this is still they're isolated from a lot of the, the traffic zones. Anything coming from southern Essos isn't going to go to Claw Isle unless they specifically want to or unless they're going on their way to White Harbor or Gull Town, one of the larger targets that's all, also along the coast there, which is which is entirely possible. So Claw Isle's got a lot of reason to make itself a worthy stop along the way for some of these places that isn't normally. Meanwhile, the spots in the north, like the Vale and the north and Bravos and Lorath and Ib, things along the northern coast, they would have a lot of reason to stop at Claw Isle on the way to these other larger destinations in the south, such as the aforementioned Sunspear, Old Town, Lannisport, if you're going all the way around, etc. Uh, so... Compare as well, Nina points out the, the how people are impressed or wonder, expect superstition or have superstitious reactions to Euron's supposedly magical ability to sail away from the coast. This is a normal superstition. It's a common superstition. Sailing away the coast is bad luck. So there's a whole nother reason why they would not go around Claw Isle because they'd want to stay close to the coast. So there's this superstition that also helps fill their coffers. It's like, oh, you know, it's not it's not entirely superstition. Some of it's just, yeah, you're a little safer if you stay by the coast. You're not going to get blown out to sea as easily and get lost or what have you, especially if you're in a craft. It doesn't do as well out in the deep waters. You want to stay in shallower waters just because your ship can't handle that. And that gives you no choice but to pass through this toll zone, right? Also, just the amount of uh, supplies your ship can carry. You know, if you, point. if you get too far out to sea and need to get more water or whatever, it's a longer trek back and people might start dying before you get there. So, you, yeah, so Claw Isle could be a stop on the way to on a longer destination, like a milestone. Like, okay, well, let's plan on stopping at Claw Isle. It's halfway to our destination, and that would involve business going one way, going both ways there. So both sides are going to do well. It's a win-win for the merchants and the locals. So this is expressed as well. This this positioning is expressed really well by the goods that they have. You saw that. It wasn't just gold and silver. It was that also. But you had a Valyrian steel axe. You had Valentine glass. You had mirish carpets. You had just wines from all over. Those weren't specified because there's lots of places that make wine. Some of them would have been from the arbor. Some of them would have been from, you know, far east, whatever. And the, this stash of goods they have kind of gives you that impression of this is a collection of trade over centuries, if, if not more, going back to the, their time in Valyria. Another way to look at it, and this is really important, is it's the transition between the Vale and the Crown Lands. The Crown Lands, as we said, the, the Clyle sits at the top, the northernmost point of the Crown Lands. Go a little bit north of Claw Isle and you're in the Vale. So that's basically the border of the Vale. And that's a really big deal because you've got, it's the border, right? Anytime a border is always a big deal for a lot of different reasons. Depend, if it's a peacetime border, well, then there's trade going back and forth between the two. And you're managing that uh, space between regions, collecting, you know, being that spot where these two regions meet. That's really important. Or if it's a wartime consideration, well, then it's even more important. Claw Isle's never been... A military base because the Vale's never been like in a sustained war with the crown lands that would 
but it would be an important military base right at the tip of the border if that scenario were ever to come to pass if the veil was at war with the crown land or something like that that would be a really important like naval base right on there right at the tip of their region it'd be really a big deal whoever had control over that would have instant access to the other side's waters at a whim you'd have to it'd be a big problem if the veil conquered claw isle <laughs> in, a, in a war situation like that it's part of why the north and the veil fought over the sisters for so long because they're both so close to each other it's like equidistant between them neither side wanted them to have that advantage uh, so yeah quicker transport from essos faster news from essos uh, their southern neighbors would have more traffic with Tyrosh, Lys, Volantis, Slavers Bay, Carth, Dorne, the Arbor, places like that, Summer Isles. But they're closer to Summer Isles, Bravos, Lorath, Ib, Gull Town, White Harbor. You, know, you made me think of something, another value of that island, uh, like strategically, militarily, it, whoever controls it, the it's all in lines of communication, but they, they could see passing by ships, even if someone like, didn't go to them, they could see that was part of why we wanted Iwo Jima in World War II, because oh. the Japanese soldiers on Iwo Jima would report to the mainland when our bombers flew by. Oh. So if we can get that island now, the mainland doesn't know when our bombers are coming. So. Oh, that's a great point. Not to mention we can land the bombers there, but yeah. it's on and on, you know. <laughs> so, and speaking of, like types of conflict, we just imagined briefly what a war between the Crown Lands and the Vale might look like. If we think about what's more likely to have been there as in terms of a military presence when the Celtigars came, besides first men enclaves, or in addition to first men enclaves, pirates. It's a great spot for pirates to set up. Catching any passing ship the way that Celtigars could set it up for taxes, a pirate enclave or a pirate king, it's a perfect spot for the same exact reasons, only they would enforce their will more violently, they would be less official, there wouldn't be anyone to deal with. You know, uh, so I, I suspect there have been different pirates here and there over time until it was settled and handled more permanently by maybe even maybe even how Celtigars would finally ended that. Although some might look at them as modern pirates if they are truly levying this type of taxation on anyone that passes by. Combining those ideas, you're not enforcing taxes on people without a little military to back that up. Otherwise, certain people from other nations would be like, Okay, so uh, you want to pay me this? I have to pay this tax. What happens if I don't? If if the what happens if I don't is we'll get mad at you, then they might just be like, "All right, see ya. I'll handle the anger. <laughs> I'll deal with that." Or we have a navy of our own that will come get you. You know, and I feel like that's probably more likely, especially given it said in that earlier quote, Valarian ships plus another allied house, the Celtigars, patrolled the area. You know, controlled the Blackwater Bay. So. Yeah, the Valarian gets the press, but the Celtigars got some ships too, and it's probably a pretty substantial amount. We're not talking hundreds of ships, but you don't need hundreds of ships to dominate local regional lords that maybe have one or two ships, if any. So it's all it's all a matter of perspective here. Yeah, the Valarians could dominate the Celtigars if they wanted to, but the Celtigars could dominate pretty much everyone else in the region, you know, uh, as far as ships go. Maybe not with full military strength, but just the ships? Sure. And there's lots of examples of, of that in the real world. Uh, Crete, that little tiny island Crete in the Mediterranean used to dominate most of the Mediterranean back in super ancient times because of their naval supremacy. And then eventually Athens did a similar thing. And it was just the city state of Athens, not all of Greece because of their navy. And then England dominated the world. There's, almost, there's only like a few dozen countries England has never invaded. And most of those invasions were backed by the Royal Navy which, you know, isn't so powerful now. It's pretty powerful, but not as powerful as it was back in the day when it could dominate half the globe. So you can see small islands dominating with naval power. Very, very realistic, even whether it's Westeros or the real world. So I like, consider for what a big deal it was that Orane Waters left with Cersei's 10 Dromans. Like, uh-oh, that's a big deal. Those are warships. Maybe... Claw Isle doesn't have 10 giant Dromans like Orane Waters does, but what if they have a couple of those plus 20 medium-sized ships and a bunch of smaller ones? Like, that's put all that together, and that's, that's a pretty big deal. You could do some damage with that. Most, most houses would, would not be able to handle that. And if they teamed up with someone that has a strong land force, then that's a really dangerous team-up. Of course, back in the day, they teamed up with the Targaryens who had dragons. <laughs> so that's even more dangerous team up. <laughs> Trump card. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so even if the Valarians had like 80% of the Navy, 20% of this massive Navy is a lot. I mean, that's like the Valarians had the biggest Navy in the world for a while. Even if it's only 10%, it's still a gigantic amount of ships, or at least gives them a gigantic amount of power in the region. It's also interesting to speculate on why the Valarians became the naval supporting force. There may have been a time back in history where the Celtigars had an opportunity to rise into that spot and they simply were beaten to the punch or to the anchor, whatever. Uh, maybe it was politics. Maybe the Valarians just were friendlier with the Targaryens and got more benefit out of it. The Targaryens gave them a better deal, you know, like a charter. Like you get to be our top ship guys because of some service you've done some exploration thing they did some deal they pulled off in the past it could have been a close run thing we have to keep in mind that the powers these houses wield now might be very different than the powers they wielded back in old valyria i mean we know the targaryens were obviously one of the few dragon lord families but there's a lot of room with valarian celtigar and whoever who knows how many other houses that aren't around anymore like like house coharis that was the the house of the Aegon's master at arms, the one who was given to Hoharan Hall at first, and that didn't last. But there were other Valyrian houses that came over besides Celtigar and Valarian, even. I can imagine this if, if the, at some point the Celtigars and Valarians were similar power level and an alliance with the Targaryens was forming, and one was going to get chosen to be the Royal Navy or whatever. I can imagine the Celticars being like, no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead and use your ships for whatever the king wants. I'll use my ships for whatever I want. Yeah, you know, you, can see it being that <laughs> you way. get mixed up in these wars and these conflicts. You make these commitments to the realm. We'll just keep our own stuff going safe and secure. You know, that's a great point. They just they looked ahead. They're like, no, we don't want to get embroiled. We they like we're ambitious, but we don't want to get ambitious by getting cl too close to the political center of things. We want to make money through trade and that. Well, like, again, soft power rather than having big armies and ships and stuff that eventually we'll come into contact with other big armies and other big ships and you may not come out ahead in that so so yeah dragonstone has been overrun maybe more than once driftmark as well like they've lost almost everything both those houses at different times have have come gone from pinnacle to almost nothing there's no evidence of that for the celtigars they've seemed to have weathered the storms a lot better in this this is an argument for why they maybe even did that in the first place. Whether it was their intent, they could certainly look back and go, ah, well, we made the right <laughs> choices. It's a little, little uh, hindsight is twenty twenty kind of thing. But still, it isn't all hindsight. You can say, yes, getting involved in politics and dragons and navies does often end in bloodshed. Who would have thought? <laughs> you know. But <laughs> if you're just sticking to trade and taxation, you could, you know, you might be able to sustain that quite a lot longer. So there's a lot of people that have noticed this, though, just because maybe some readers haven't, maybe some people in Westeros haven't. Some people have taken note, like Sir Axel, for example. But Sir Axel, he wasn't the only one in on this plan. Remember, Salador San was his conspirator with this plan. And, and here's Sala sort of complaining humorously about Davos is stopping the plan. All that good gold on Claw Isle that might have been mine, it makes me old and tired to think of it. <laughs> when I die impoverished, my wives and concubines will curse you, Onion Lord. Lord Celtigar has many fine wines that I am now not tasting. A sea eagle he had trained to fly from the wrist, and a magic horn to summon krakens from the deep. Very useful such a horn would be to pull down Tyrashi and other vexing creatures. <laughs> <laughs> so he knows. He's figured it out. He's like, he, he's seen the same things I'm talking about. He's like, okay, these guys have been sitting there for hundreds of years, collecting their taxes, making trade deals. Where's all that money going? Where have they spent it? They haven't, it looks like. So it must be sitting there in chests of rubies and in fine wines and in a sea eagle that he trains and this magic horn. That's where the money is. It's in that castle. So, yeah, it makes sense to him. He's sussed it out. He's got the kind of mind that works this way. And his logic is pretty strong. I mean, I follow. I follow his train of thought here and would add to it. But there's and I would think some other people that understand this would be some of their other regional 
sometimes rivals, sometimes partners. Look at Sharp Point. There's that jut that sticks out in the southern point of Blackwater Bay that has the houses Bar Emmon and Massey. Bar Emmon is a similar bent. They're not an island house, but they are a seaborne house, and they are their their sigil is a uh, one of those sword suntail, the big marlin type fish. Whereas Massey's the Massey's of Stone Dance have a like a whirlpool, a tricolor whirlpool. So there's all this nautical themed stuff around here. Duskendale is a really important port as well, and that's really close by, uh, almost as close as Dragonstone or Driftmark. And then Maidenpool is on the other side of Crackclaw Point. The southern p- part of Crackclaw Point is filled with these old school first men that are in- insular and not outward looking. But the northern side of Crackclaw Point is where Maidenpool is and where the Bay of Crabs is, which is where the Trident empties out. And so that's another big deal. Another huge trade angle for Crackclaw Point is they're right outside the Bay of Crabs. The Bay of Crabs is where the Trident empties out. So that any trade up the trident can be is very accessible to them. And anyone coming out of the trident and going out to sea, if they're going south, they're going to pass by Crackclaw Point. Or they could, or uh, and, and thus Claw Isle, unless they're going north. And even if they want to go north, they might decide to pass by Claw Isle anyway, just for trade purposes. So again, what an incredible spot. They're right on the cusp of the Vale. They're near Maidenpool. They're near all the ships of the, or all the castles along the Trident via being near the Trident. They're on the southern point of the Vale. They're not far from Gulltown. They're right across the way from Pentos and Mir, not far from Bravos. Close to King's Landing, Driftmark, all these spots. Just a lot, all these things say money. <laughs> all these things say wealth. All these things say trade. All these things say. Well, what's one of the most important things or the most important thing when opening a a storefront? The top three, what is that old joke, Sean? The top three most important things for a business are location, location, location. location. (laughs) Yeah, that's less true than it used to be with online businesses. But for storefronts, it's still really, really important. It's still Mm -hmm. true or close to true. That's also true for trade ports where lots of shops are located. (laughs) That location matters, too. So even if it's not the most important thing or the three most important things, it's still among the most important things. Yeah. Even with online, uh, the, the world we're in now has changed it, but it hasn't completely changed. Yeah. It. Even take away all the exaggeration. It's still there or, or the, yeah. the time, the, even with times are changing. Good said. So, so, so Davos such shuts down the plan to uh, attack Slaw Isle. <laughs> uh, Ker Axel, I'm sorry, Sir Axel and Sla- Claw Isle. <laughs> Catanus, his agreement, uh, he. <laughs> Catanus. <laughs> There's too many words to switch here. <laughs> <laughs> so Davo shuts down the plan. Here's what a description of it would have been uh, had, it, had the plan been carried out. Leave Claw Isle a desolation of ash and bone, fit only for carrion crows. So the realm might see the fate of those who bed with Lannisters. Now insert someone else in place of the Lannisters. Just insert any house. And you get a sentiment of what House Celtigar may have been facing had they not remained loyal to House Targaryen. Right? If you if they had ever bailed on tar- the Targaryens and sided with somebody else, desolation of ash and bone would have been their fate had that play not worked out for them. Brought shadow and bone. <laughs> shadow and bone. <laughs> a decolation of ash and <laughs> of shadow and bone, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Stannis, that's why I brought up Stannis as sort of playing the model role for all these different Targaryens over the years and what they might have thought about the Celtigars. Like, well, if these Celtigars don't stay in line, we'll leave them a desolation, uh, leave Claw Isle a desolation of ash and bone a way, in a way that only we can with dragons. Now, Stannis doesn't have that available to him. He just had, you know, the fact that Claw Isle was lightly garrisoned at that point because they lost most of their soldiers fighting for him. It was probably like that back in Valyria too. Like any of the lesser houses that was subordinate to one of the Dragonlord families was like, well, if we don't do what they say, our fate could be ash and bone. So we better do what they say. Uh, the, and they're close to Dragonstone and Driftmark. So even even once the dragons died out, 
the calculus isn't that different. They're still weaker than those two houses. They still have to do what those houses say or face the military consequences. But that doesn't mean they don't have leverage. It doesn't mean they don't have power. This is why we talk about the phrase soft power. Claw Isle lacks strategic importance right now because it's not in a military situation that makes it relevant. But it could be, and it's even if it wasn't, like in current times, it's not easy to take, even accepting times when it's depleted like it was after the Battle of the Blackwater. But that was that's not a normal situation. It's not normally going to be depleted like that. It's not normally going to have all its ships burned up by wildfire and its men dead at the bottom of Blackwater Bay. So they have the ability to do like what Stannis saw there. His lords are making demands of him. He can't just tell them what to do and expect them to follow and fall in line and not have their own minds about things. They are as loyal as he makes them or as they want to be, or as if he's given them a reason to follow because they like it, they'll follow. Or if they have to, they'll follow or because of both reasons. Stannis didn't have that strong of a grip on them. So this is, this is the type of angle we're looking at when we consider how Celtigars, their peril is what if they choose wrong? They've got sides to take. They have to take a side. It's hard to stay neutral. If they pick the wrong side, they could be destroyed. That's what a lot of these lesser houses are constantly faced with any time a civil war breaks out. And that's something we don't look at as often because we're often more focused on the big players. Like House Targaryen, of course, they're doomed. If they fail, they started this war. Or they're the ones at the top, so they're the ones fighting to hold on. That's not as true for their subordinates. They can jump off the ship and say, hey, we give up. We'll bend the knee to the the winning side and hope to get the best deal possible uh, by conceding now rather than fighting to the bitter end. The Targaryens will fight to the bitter end if extinction is on the plate for, if is on tap for them, right? Like, like Tywin wanted them entirely annihilated because he had to prove what side he was on and he had to make sure there was no pushback. It's there's no option like that for these these smaller houses. They can't make that big demonstrative murdering of the heirs. They're not in a position to do that. They don't have they didn't have the big army that took King's Landing and sacked it. That's they're never going to be in that position where they can make that call. Their considerations are different. If Tywin if it had gone wrong for Tywin, he could go hole up and they're like, "Oh wow, well, let's talk." <laughs> Cuz Who's going to invade Casterly Rock and his 50,000 troops and his bottomless wealth? I mean, you'd rather use diplomacy there, right? Like, that's such a dangerous, difficult spot. No matter how much Tywin deserves to be executed, the reality is to bring him to justice, 100,000 people have to die, right? And that's, that's not worth it. So that's the, what we're used to thinking about. So it's very different when you're thinking about these smaller houses. They don't have that level of power, but in some ways they're more interesting because they're balanced on a knife's edge a lot of times here, caught between a rock and a hard place. Sometimes the rock is a great, when I'm talking about Castle Rock especially. Celticar and some of these houses would have a little advantage being an island because it's a little tougher, if even if they are on the losing side, to go punish them yeah you need to get ships just the effort you have to do that you could go punish seven other houses on land that are nearby you um not that you wouldn't or the dragons couldn't but uh but it, it is an advantage i i can imagine uh, smaller houses on these islands are more likely to be loyal to the houses that have navies yes <laughs> The yeah, that's a tipping point them. if it's close who do you think's gonna win well not so much who's gonna win but who's gonna be able to get us if they win yeah the one <laughs> uh, you're right. let's be on that side yeah that's a great point yeah it's the ones who can hurt them as they're worth what they're worried about totally totally true and you're also right to point out that the island gives them a little it gives them a little more leverage they can make a little bit bigger demands they can wait a little longer they can take a little bit larger risk because the the risk of of repudiation of pushback is smaller because logistically it would involve hopping in ships invading and that's a lot more expensive it's a much more expensive punishment to issue to your so you'd rather make an example of someone else and say okay celticars this is you if you don't follow us next time <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> they're, and they're like okay okay we will they're less likely to be made the example <laughs> of unless it's a case like this where they're they the reason sir axel wanted to make an example of them is because yes they bent the knee to joffrey they're like okay you got us. We lost. Uh, 
but Sir Axel's like, that just the, the cost of betrayal. It's like, that's not betrayal. That's like, what choice did yeah. he have? You know? <laughs> it's like, uh, it, yeah, it, it, I, I feel like he's being very unfair. I think Davos really made a good point is that, you know, they, they were loyal. They were committed. They sent all their troops. They fought. They died. They did everything they could, except one dude in the end decided it's hopeless. I'll surrender. And now you want to punish all the kids and wives back home because the one leader, you know, what lesson do you think they're going to learn from that? Yeah. To be more loyal to in the past? That's, I don't think so. That's basically yeah. what Davos was saying. And we all like, yeah, Davos yeah. is totally right here. So uh it's great it's a really great point like that scene is so powerful and it's neat to look at the Celtigar side of it because we've always just looked at it from the side of the characters who are making that decision we've always looked at Davos and and Sir Axel and the philosophy of 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 duty and the limits of that and that's something I brought up at the beginning the limits of duty like Stannis is like no there is no limit and Davos is like sure there's got to be limits man there's got to be limits and Sir Axel's like no you're a traitor too you know <laughs> it's like and then and Stannis is finally like shut up man <laughs> you're like thank you Stannis maybe you should have told him to shut up sooner but we like the, it, it makes for great discussion after the after the fact <laughs> uh yeah so there's also like but there are some downsides of course to be on an island storms are going to be more uh, of a problem you know, you're more out there in the middle of the bay uh lots of it's trained it's, sailing is harder than a lot of other duties uh, you can't just like when you're calling up the men for the levy you, you give them a few practice jabs with the spear like dunk did but what do you, how do you do that on you can't just do that with ships like give them a few like if they're being oarsmen <laughs> sure but like <laughs> it's about the, about it that's about it right like any other job on a ship is too complicated for something you can learn in, in a week you know so it, the difference between having to cross water or not, wh- whether it's an ocean or a river, it's a huge, huge logistical difference in, in I don't know, a, a war, a strategy or whatever. It's like having to, you have, you have to stop. Everything just has to stop and get loaded up. You're very vulnerable Wagons, at that moment. And when you unload, yeah. you need all sorts of extra time and equipment to build the boats, to get people on them, food and water load it up and unload it, get, getting horses on there. All, it, it's just like a huge holdup a huge moment of vulnerability. You need lots of extra supplies. It's more difficult to communicate yeah. once the boats head out. You can't tell them to turn around or they're as a surrender or they got reinforcements. They like they're just off in the ocean you doing can't whatever send they're going to do after to tell them to come back or Exactly. Yeah, you know, that yeah. doesn't work. Like that yeah, all I, kinds of which is what Stan is which is what Davos was counting on when he sent uh young Edric Storm away. He's like, "Nah, there's there is no way to get him back." Like uh, that was part of the yeah. the deal like Part of why this was going to work is even if you torture me, like there's no getting him back. He's gone. I can't make him come back. That's it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a great point as well. So that's why this is really important to think about. The leadership comes in so crucially when you have these great resources. You can make mistakes and still come out of it okay because you have this cushion. Like Tywin could mess up whole entirely and still go run back to Castle Rock and hole up there and and survive because he's got that base to. It covers a lot of his mistakes. But Claw Isle can't make a mistake. Like, Claw Isle came within the Onion Knight's courage of being wiped out because of basically things entirely out of their control. Like you said, they did everything they were supposed to do. The Lord himself was captured. Like, Ardrian Celtigar was in the Battle of the Blackwater. He was captured, too. It wasn't just his men. He bent the knee after being captured. <laughs> it wasn't like, okay, you got me. I'm going to send my letter of... of uh, peace my surrender my surrender letter no no he was there in person like they would have killed him had he not literally one of stannis's knights was like i won't surrender and they killed him so we see exactly what's going to happen so like literally stannis and axel are calling for people to go down with the ship literally <laughs> you know to or else they've they're traitors like maybe theoretically that guy could have said no i won't bend the knee and he gets killed and then then what? Yeah, then what's then the result what? of that? Exactly. Now Stannis is winning the war? No. And now like, like people are just like, okay, well, I'm not fighting for you. You <laughs> that's how you treat your most loyal people? Like, yikes. Yeah. So, hmm. So just a, just a quick word about Crack Claw Point. I wonder if you could do some really like obscure smaller scale stories about a picture a picture of Celtigar tax collector encountering a squisher <laughs> while he's going to crack claw point to collect taxes <laughs> and there's an encounter with someone with 
weird teeth or their skin isn't quite right. It's something out of like something out of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, yeah, or someone talking to them about things like that's not a thing. Like they're just trying to scare me away. And then yeah, you could write a little horror story about a Celtigar of Valyrian descent walking amongst the pines and bogs and uh, of of Crackclaw Point and <laughs> touring the area and. Maybe not even a tax collector. Maybe trying to someone just go in there for some other reason. Something less offensive to the locals. Something that would get them to open up a little. Yeah. Uh, yeah I remember last week thinking about the, the potential of stories from the Kohor Forest. It's ooh, just so yeah. big. There would be so many you know, potential adventures to have in there. It's, it's, the Crack Club Point isn't nearly as big, but still, like... A, we had a bunch of adventures in there just from like a couple characters, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. I mean, Brienne's Brienne's time there is really entertaining. I mean, it's a nimble Dick is a great character, but the stories he tells of the area are really engaging. It's, it's not just the character. It's the actual things he's saying. It's both. And you know, another thing that's important. We talk about resources. You're talking about navies like Driftmark, Dragonstone, Claw Isle. These probably don't have a lot of, trees at least not anymore they may have at one point we said the same thing about bear island when we talked about it like they probably still have some forests because bear Island's a little larger it's more northerly and they're not so centrally located they don't they have navies but not giant ones they're not uh, their needs for timber might not be quite as substantial they may not have as many markets to sell them in but cracklaw point being right there for them that's where I bet a lot of their interest in the area lies, not just in collecting taxes, but some of that good timber for those ships. And they might have to haul some of it. And over. firewood. I want to point out again, that's point, like a, an underestimated value of, of timber. But I've pointed this out before too, but that was, you know, Ben Franklin is kind of known as an American revolutionary, a founding father or whatever, but his personal dream, his personal point of pride and goal in his life was environmentalism. Mm -hmm. He saw the forest of Pennsylvania just being wiped down and people coughing and hacking their lungs out because of the burnt wood. It, it was, you know, it was from fire. So he was trying to make the, the Franklin stove. He was trying to make more efficient use of burning wood and less smoke in the home because people have to burn wood to stay warm. That was like the fuel. Right now, it just press a button, a thermostat, and we just get warmth in our homes. But in the past, you had to burn wood to stay warm yeah. and that would forests had to be leveled for that and people would get sick from it and so on so and a lot of that like that's a lot of where there's like charcoal making operations would be in a forest because that's where the the raw materials come from wood and you know charcoal obviously is even more useful for for heating but it comes from wood in the first place <laughs> or or peat yeah. or both uh so let's take a take a little break here and we'll come back to talk about the doom and the conquest and Blackfire rebellions and the Dance of the Dragon, all the different milestone events and how how Celtigar played a role or didn't in any of these things. Um, a friend of the show uh, wrote a book, and I want to share it with y'all. It's called The Kings of Camelot. It's a new fantasy novel that chronicles the Pendragon family dynasty and their struggle to navigate conflict, prophecy, and succession. I'm sure all y'all are familiar with the basic stories, if not the deeper stories. So you want to check this one out. It's available on Amazon. We'll put a link down in the description if you're watching live. If not, you can find the link in the podcast description. Who is it that wrote that? The guy who runs the uh, Game of Thrones quotes account on Twitter. Oh, has cool. has a lot cool. of followers and shares some of the best quotes. So I always love the great quotes. I'm a fan of, of, of quotes from our series. It's so good. It's such a quotable series. That's one thing I like. It like, gives me a little bit of, I don't want to say, I hesitate to use the word arrogance, but, you know, something that makes me feel like, more intellectual <laughs> or like superior to other book series like you can't compare them all that way but some of them are just like no one ever quotes that series because like it's fun it's great but notice how people quote the hell out of game of thrones a song of ice and fire it's the most one of the most quotable series of all time and that's because the writing is so good <laughs> it's, it's, other series just aren't as quotable that doesn't mean they're not good doesn't mean they're not enjoyable it doesn't mean they're not really fun it doesn't mean they're not worth your time but I think that's a feather in George's cap that it's really hard to find something quoted as much as this. So, yeah, so check out the Kings of Camelot if that's your bag. If you like the Arthurian stories, it bodes well for you. Uh, in the old Game of Thrones RPG, the one that was available on um, a variety of consoles and PC, you can play the character Moore's Westford, who is on the wall. He's uh, He takes the black. 
at one point you wind up with Terence Celtigar as a uh, recruit under your tutelage. Apparently he's real cocky, <laughs> probably because he comes from House Celtigar. He has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder for being uh, like a like like just like Waymar Royce has, a little arrogant, and, you know, because he comes from a big family. I think it match Terence. Celtigar really matches like Clarence Crab. <laughs> Terrence and Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> Clarence's parents had a real nice marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Crusader Kings 3. It's time for the announcement. Crusader Kings 3 is out. It's been out for a while, actually. But the mod for A Song of Ice and Fire, that's our main interest, is in beta now. We've had the beta for a couple weeks. We played it a little bit, but it's officially out for all the beta. I'm going to be streaming it starting Friday, April 21st on YouTube. But after that, we're moving to Twitch. We're going to start doing the regular streams on Twitch. They will be available for rewatch on YouTube on the playlists. So you're going to want to subscribe to that playlist or keep an eye on it. But the instructions on how to find our Twitch channel will be in that stream. So Friday, April 21st, 2023, streaming CK3. Check it out. And that'll contain instructions for where to find future streams. Also good opportunity to remind y'all to check out history of westeros on tiktok because ashea did something pretty cool over on tiktok related to this yeah i just shared a little video to promote the um ck3 gate agot mod so i did a little tour through westeros um showed some castles and uh it's my first time putting my face on our tiktok um, we've yeah. done a little different kind of content there so yeah if you want to follow us on tiktok i'll put the link in the description as well it's just at the history of westeros and well you know we put content there you know every once in a while it looks really good i mean the locations the the graphics of this version of the game are uh several iterations better than ck2 which was a great game in its own right but this is just so much nicer looking and you can really see the detail of the way they're described. Like you go to Pike, for example, which you can see in the Shea's video, you can see the connected bridges and the collapsing stone around it. And my it's favorite just, detail. It's book accurate. Yeah. My favorite detail that I point out in this video is um, at the high tower, the base of the high tower is the fused black stone. It's so cool. Y'all they, they really, really pay attention. And it's like, these are people who are, on our level of detail understanding, I mean, us as a group, the fans and the listeners here, like the deeper fandom, they they know their stuff. And I can't thank them enough for all their effort. We're going to have a lot of great times streaming that game. Y'all who haven't come out to watch before, it's a good time to check it out. There's a good group of people to come out every time, hang out, have good times, making decisions, helping me decide who to attack, who to promote, who to marry, what child to name heir, all sorts of fun stuff like that. The way the game works is you you play a lord or lady or king or queen, or and then when you die, you take over as your heir. So it's a role-playing, dynastic, full military, political, random events, magic. All the Game of Thrones stuff is in there. It's really good stuff. And you have multiple timelines to choose from. Help me decide what house to play. I could go on and on. Just tune in on Friday. And we'll continue Friday the discussion. Friday at 6 p.m. Then. Eastern. Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. That's right. Thank you for inserting that time. I forgot to do that. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool if we could get anyone from that team to be on our stream or to come to a con or something Maybe. like that. Maybe. They would, I would heap the praise on them and buy them all the drinks they wanted. <laughs> 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 all right. So let's talk about the Doom. The Doom, of course, was the big milestone, as it always is for a lot of things. It doesn't. We don't have a lot to say here uh, in terms of how it affected how Celtigar in terms of in, in terms of differences as to how it impacted other houses. But they would be impacted more than most, of course, because of their connections, As we, but we've already kind of been over that. Here's a quick quote to get us started. For the best part of a hundred years after the Doom of Valyria, the rightly named Century of Blood, House Targaryen looked east, not west, and took little interest in the affairs of Westeros. So the Targaryens were more concerned looking east, and probably the Celtigars did too. Surely they had their own business, and maybe they were looking both ways, because they perhaps had more a sense of where their future lie. But they'd still be beholden to what the Targaryens wanted. They're still kind of required to follow their lead on some things. That said, the Targaryens' involvement in the east during the Century of Blood is not super well defined we're not sure what they were doing other than we know Aegon stopped the volant or helped stop the volantines from reestablishing the valyrian hegemony 
he went east on Balerion and burned some ships and did that stuff. But we're not sure what else happened. But this is there's a lot of unknown time period we're talking about here. It is a century of blood, not the decade of blood or the week of blood. So, as we've said, as Littlefinger has said, you know, chaos is a ladder. Uh, that's a show only line, but it is appropriate and fitting here for multiple reasons. A, yes, chaos is a ladder for people who know how to take advantage of chaos. Ch- times of change are also times of opportunity. And the, t- the doom was a time of great change. Another reason Littlefinger is such a great comparison here is, what did I say at the beginning about how Celtigar, they've been master coin more than any other house. Littlefinger, some of his most devious moves were made while he was master coin because he knows how to wield soft power extremely well in ways that People aren't noticing. People can't comprehend. Like he's loaning and doing debt schemes and uh, fractional lending stuff that modern banks do that no one even understands other than people doing it. (laughs) Putting his cronies in positions of power that aren't like lords that someone's going to take note of and be upset by, but people who are in control of decisions of moving goods between lords, something that might go under the radar, but he is getting power from it. And that's something that really, really is kind of hard to think about or hard to uh, to grasp, is that these some of these lords and kings and queens are so powerful that money issues are beneath them. They consider dealing with money below them. Like, it's kind of hard to think about that because to, to frame that in modern times, because like the most powerful people in the world right now, everybody thinks about are, are like billionaire. The billionaire class are probably the most powerful people in the world right now. There's maybe a few exceptions, but not really, because the most powerful people in the world that are, are powerful for other reasons are also billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, like Putin is a billionaire in addition to controlling Russia's military. So good example. Uh, so it's hard to think about the most powerful people in the world in an era like this, that just money is beneath them. It's like, that's hard to fathom because in the modern times, no one is really like that, <laughs> but it's a, it's a real thing. Uh, and it was true in the real world that m- matters of money. Oh, I don't do that. You know, like, Oh, I let Harold handle that. No, like Harold isn't even your husband in this case. You have <laughs> some dude that makes a lot of money and he sets his own salary. <laughs> Like he, like pay yourself what you think you're worth. Like that's what the master of coin does. Like I don't think the king decides the master of coins salary, right? No, that's all part of his own. His job is to also come up with his own pay. <laughs> they have these guys have a lot of leeway to make decisions because the king is too busy thinking about invasions and I don't know dreams of ice and fire and the others invading to worry about like whether we should raise taxes half a percent or change it from one copper to two coppers, like the little decisions like that, which are actually huge decisions mm-hmm. <laughs> to him. It's a small decision because he, he, off, he just farms that decision out to someone else. So it's really, really s- starts to blow you away when you think about when we shift from the top level thinking, the Kings and Queens to the second level, the Lord's, and ladies with their armies to the third level of the bankers and the money people and realize this third level is like level one in current society. The most powerful people are the ones with all the money. Like, and it was maybe even true then they just didn't recognize it. The people at the top didn't recognize how much the money people were actually controlling them (laughs) because they weren't paying enough attention to what the money people were doing. Anyway, all this comes back to what House Celtigar would have been doing during the Doom or just after it. They've got all their sh- money. They have this kind of established savvy potentially, or maybe this is where that savvy came from. This is when they first started to like, okay, well, this is we're, thir- we're the third tier in this scheme of military and royal power. Royal power first, military power second, financial power third. That's where we're at. Let's become masters of that. And like I said, maybe they already were back in Valyria, who knows, but they certainly have been, either they got even better at it in Westeros or continued it in Westeros or started it one way or the other. So while the Targaryens and Valarians were out there conquering and doing their thing, the Celticars seem to have been setting themselves up for a longer, more stable run of holding tight. Uh, The Axel Florence of the world um, you know, notwithstanding, Celticars aren't the Iron Bank. They're not that rich. But the Iron Bank doesn't actually have a navy or, you know, a castle. 
The Celticars do have those things. So, a little, a little from column A, a little from column B. So, yeah, it's... Uh, and just like the uh, Iron, just like the Faceless Men, they don't want to call too much attention to themselves, right? <laughs> they don't want to call, bring up just how wealthy they actually are. All right, the Conquest. Aegon, for all his reasons, for after the Century of Blood died down, Lord Crispian Celtigar added his strength to Aegon through the Conquest. Crispian, yes, that was his name. Similar to the name Damon made fun of. <laughs> like oh, Crispin Cole. Was that your name? Crispy, yeah. Crispy, yeah. So apparently there that is a real name in Westeros. <laughs> and it sounds like a good pie. Yeah, it does. Yeah, crispy. <laughs> mm. I was just picturing like a crispy crab. It's crab pie, yeah. <laughs> mm. So this was probably a really big deal. Like Aegon got stronger as he went. He more and more lords bent the knee to him and added his strength to his, and he was able to go after progressively larger targets. But the Celtigars were with him from the beginning, and so those first supporters counted for the most and got some of the biggest rewards. Lord Crispian was the first ever master of coin on the first ever small council. This implies maybe some of that experience. Maybe it was just pure nepotism, like, well, we're going to give him the next biggest job. The Valarians got master ships. We're going to give this guy master of coin. But... This is part of why I think they already had some of this monetary fiduciary savvy prior to the doom because of this appointment. Um, it somewhat implies this is what they were already good at. The Valarians got master ships, the strong, the Tully got uh, Tullys and Strongs and Bra the first Baratheon were the early hands, things like that. Things that Aegon seemed to trust people were things that they were good at. Aegon wasn't a super nepotistic guy he was more a little more about merit sure he put some people in positions because he kind of had to because of political expediency but he wasn't like say an egg on the unworthy who just you get the job if i can sleep with your daughter those are like opposite ends of the spectrum one end of the spectrum is stannis who's like a, a good model for giving people a job based on their actual performance Versus someone like Egg on the Fourth, who's purely giving them the job as an opportunity to get something out of it. Like, I will give you this job if you give me something. It's like a like a, a raffle or an auction. Like, because <laughs> to him, the office is just an opportunity to to exploit and get more wealth for yourself. So I'm going to get a cut of that, right? Whereas someone like Stannis or Egon expects them to, you know, actually do the job with a reasonable amount of competence, not just as a way to enrich themselves. So this Lord Crispian uh, was probably competent, um, unlike some later Celtigar masters of coin. <laughs> but it's a, also, Nina points out, it's a significant level of trust, too. Like, yes, we just made this point about maybe the, the powers that be often don't understand just how important money is and kind of think of it as beneath them. But they're not totally stupid about it. They don't just hand it off to just some random sh schmo. They give it to someone they think is partly competent if not extremely competent someone they can trust and that's just who they chose also a lot of lords might have been like that but we don't know if Aegon was like that right, right? that's true yeah robert was definitely like that yeah. but i can imagine Aegon and some other kings were not yeah so here's tywin's probably not like that tywin probably understands oh yeah <laughs> yeah tywin's like a little more a little more column a and column b tywin's one of those guys like okay i will expect you to good job i also don't mind if you exploit the office for yourself just as long as the good job is done on top of that like that's that's the kind of man Tywin is he doesn't care about the ethics he just wants the job to get done costs later you know if, if the cost comes up again 30 years from now I don't care he cares if it comes up in three years but kick the can if you're gonna kick the can down the road it needs to be way down the road it needs to be like to the next generation sick the sand <laughs> kick, kick the sand sick the sand <laughs> Yeah, Dornish bastards are, are uh, they're not sands, they're cans, yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so let's remind ourselves of the potential power of a master of soin, I mean master of coin, via Tyrion's musings on Littlefinger. It's substantial. Like, the power a master of coin wields is probably bigger than you might have realized. Here it goes. The keepers of the keys were his, all four. The king's counter and the king's scales were men he'd named. The officers in charge of all three mints, harbor masters, tax farmers, custom sergeants, wool factors, toll collectors, 
pursers, wine factors, nine of every ten belonged to Littlefinger. They were men of middling birth, by and large, merchant sons, lesser lordlings, sometimes even foreigners, but judging from their results, far more able than their high-born predecessors. No one had ever thought to question the appointments, and why should they? Littlefinger was no threat to anyone. A clever, smiling, genial man, everyone's friend, always able to find whatever gold the king or his hand required, and yet of such undistinguished birth, one step up from a hedge knight, he was not a man to fear. He had no banners to call, no army of retainers, no great stronghold, no holdings to speak of, no prospects of a great marriage. Of course, a lot of those things changed over time. He did have holdings to speak of. He did have a great stronghold. He does have maybe not an army of retainers, but he does have retainers. He does have, he had prospects of a great marriage. He married Liza Tully. So those things did happen. He used that soft power to turn it into hard power or harder power. And the parameters are a little different here, but it's a very similar scenario. The Celtigars aren't one person, but you could look at any individual Celtigar and see a similar thing. Yes, they do have the higher birth. They're not one step up from a hedge knight. They are sort of a man to fear, but they're still pretty small in terms of these other aspects. Yes, they do have banners to call, but they're not big. They're not going to terrify too many people with their with their soldiers or even their navies or both combined. They don't have a great stronghold. They have a smaller stronghold. They have a holding, but it's not a big one. It's so small, we don't even know the name. They might have prospects of a great marriage. They have had a few great marriages, but generally they're not a big threat. So it's a very similar picture you're painting here when you look, when you apply this to the Celtigars. There's two aspects to this. One is the not noticing because there's no reason to fear him. Why is little why would we worry about Littlefinger, right? That's one angle to this. The other angle is that list of everything he controls. Holy crap. The keepers are the keys. The king's counter. The king's scale. I don't even know what those things are. <laughs> but they sound powerful. They sound like they control lots of money. All three mints? He controls all three mints? Are you kidding me? That's like one guy controlling, like, financial policy and the Federal Reserve, you know? <laughs> and, like, the tax policy and a bunch of different industries. The tax rates on a bunch of different large-scale luxury industries. Like... God, it's like it's like having the president of Bank of America also be the secretary of the Treasury, which we've kind of have had things sort of like that. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, and, but, and it hasn't worked out well. No, it yeah. So but you could, exactly like so. Wow. I mean, it, when you really list it all out, it's like, damn, no wonder Littlefinger is like, wow, he has a lot of power. Yeah, there's none of these are soldiers, but that's a lot of money. That's a lot of people that answer to him. A lot of let's say he just gets one percent of all the amounts that each of these people steal. <laughs> it like, adds up to vast sums. And it's like they decided to to give him some of those things he didn't have that made him not a threat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're just like, hey, Littlefinger will take care of this. We don't like, have yeah, to worry about Let's give him Hall. Let's give him like some of these, these trappings of power that'll let him make a great marriage potentially. Yep. Uh, yeah. So just think the Celtigars similarly, except the Celtigars don't, or at least... You can't say that about them as a whole. Have haven't had um, uh, Littlefinger's ambition. They may not have had his genius either, but they've been in his position uh, or in a position like his many times. And when they were, some of them were in richer positions or in positions of less chaos. Like Littlefinger's got his role during a time of change and tumult. There's a lot of Celticars would have had this position in times of peace which in some ways are easier to exploit because when everything's going well, people aren't too likely to look under the cover. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. To Celticar, if lots of money's rolling in, the taxes are doing well, the Celticars are taking a little extra for themselves, they start taking more, no one's going to notice. It's sort of like the trick a lot of businesses play on the public when there's inflation. It was like inflation. Everybody knows there's inflation. Oh, we have to raise our prices because of inflation. In some cases, it's true. In some cases, it's not. They just say that. <laughs> and they're just like, oh, we have no choice to raise our prices. because The Celticars could do all sorts of things like that. They're like, oh, yeah, well, the price of crabs has gone up. What can we do about it? You know, we have to, we, we're just adjusting to the market rate. You know, sometimes it'll be true. Sometimes it's a scam. And for the customer, it's hard to tell the difference. You can imagine, too, like if 
things are going well. If not broke, don't fix it. Tywin maybe not caring about the ethics as long as you get the job done. Let's say the king or Tywin or whoever they expect to make, I don't know, a million gold pieces. They could tell the master of coin, like, as long as I make a million gold pieces, I don't care if you make 100,000 gold pieces. But if I only make 900,000 gold pieces and you make 100,000, no, yeah. I need to make my million. Yeah. So it might get to the point where the king's making his million and Littlefinger is making 500,000. You know, <laughs> like the king just wanted a million. Here you go. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Or he, Littlefinger could even give the king 1.2 million <laughs> and he'd it's get 300,000 for himself. And a king would be so elated, not realizing he's losing out on 300,000. And he might be wrong. I mean, Littlefinger might not be wrong. I'm like, he, he brought that money in, gave him his cut. I, I don't, I don't yeah. honestly fault yeah. him necessarily. But to some degree, that. he deserves a, a, a bonus for especially, doing so well. Especially yeah. in that scenario you gave where you're like, oh, the king asked for to make 1 million and Littlefinger brought him 1.2 million. Well, yeah, let him take, like, that's going to motivate him to do good work is to make that money. I don't know. Now, the the problem, of course, comes when you look at, say, the Roman model of taxation would be there were people that were just given charge of certain regions and said, we need you to get this much taxes out of it. Anything else you get to keep is the part in parentheses. So they're just yeah. going to do whatever they can to just like there's no like the problem is that, that, that extra violence. money is coming at the expense of the people. Yes, right. Exactly. People who made the wine or built the road or harvested the crop or whatever. They should be keeping that money, not little fingers, people who so. don't <laughs> have the power to say no to these raised taxes. They say no. And yeah. they're like, yes, yes. And then they come at you with their swords. And you're like, OK, yes, I, I have to give you what you say. So yeah, I think ultimately I'm like, is the is this tax money going to help the people? Are there improved roads, like health care? Like what's going on with bulk of this money? Worth it if that money is actually going to improve like King's Landing and the realm itself. If it's not, then well, if, it's all just corrupt, period. Yeah. It doesn't really if matter. little if Littlefinger's hoarding it away so he can buy a bigger castle yeah. or, you know, buy his bride a nicer jewelry or whatever, no, it's not worth it. If if it's so that Robert can throw a bigger tournament or yeah. you know, yeah. sleep around more or whatever, no, it's not worth or it. But right, if it's if it's funding reserve crops for winter, you know, if it's building, improving roads and, uh, you know, et cetera, then, yes, then it's worth it. But... It's worth it, I think. I think, <laughs> I think it's good. It's, it's uh, funny that you bring up the crops for winter thing because as we see, and it's, I guess you haven't actually read this little, this, this uh, Winds of Winter chapter, but there's in the Elaine's Winds of Winter chapter, Littlefinger is discussing with the other lords how to exploit the food crisis, yeah. <laughs> how to make money <laughs> off of people being broke. Like, no, don't sell your food yet. People are starving. Wait till they're really starving, <laughs> and then you'll make even more. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. damn. So, yeah, that's how he thinks. Uh, so this is, yeah, this all applies very well to House Celtigar. There's probably been times where they've hoarded grain in winter and maybe times when they didn't because the, the particular Lord Celtigar wasn't, uh, you know, maybe had a little bit more um, sympathy or empathy in his, in his bones or in his soul. But a lot of times, this is exactly the kind of game they'd be playing. They just look at it like a market or like an opportunity. And there's no, there's no humans involved here. It's just gains and losses. That's how they might look at it. So the early power held by House Celtigar continued even after the death of Crispian. Uh, he would have died, we're not sure, probably around the year 8. Because Lord Alton Celtigar was named Hand of the King in 9 AC. Now, Lord Alton Celtigar. If it was just Alton Celtigar, it would be more confusing. But since he was Lord Celtigar, this means he was the guy that probably took over after Crispian. So probably his heir, probably, well, definitely his heir, almost definitely his heir, probably his son, but it could have been his brother or something. Anyway, so Alton Celtigar holding the highest position other than King itself, the highest office as Hand of the King. And this would have been an important time. It was the tail end of the Dornish War right when Meraxes was shot down. So this would have, he would have been handed the king when there were cries of vengeance. They were like, oh, we got to get this. It's funny to call that vengeance. And you guys were the invaders. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and he had a lot to live up to. Nina points out Lord Tully had been hand most recently, but Ori's Baratheon was the first hand of the king. And he was, you know, was also Valyrian and half brother to Aegon. And was a big supporter during the First Ornish War as well. Like, he led troops personally and literally lost a hand. And, and was part of the reason he left the job was because he was angry about not having his hand. And was like, it's 
bitter that a man without a hand is the hand. The same, some of the same jokes that Jamie and Cersei made, but in a different context. Actually, I'm pretty sure the wording is that he became crabby after losing his hand <laughs> or crabbed. So, yeah, that's on point for today. Hmm. I, I would be crabby losing my hand, too. So, not Lyra- so grabby. <laughs> not grabby. That's true. <laughs> grabby, <not> grabby. <laughs> Half as grabby. <laughs> <laughs> there were, in addition to, we don't know what side Lord Celtigar took in terms of whether he was like a, a call, like trying to calm things down, or maybe he was one of the ones like egg, urging Aegon on, like, no, they killed your sister, they killed the queen, they killed a dragon. Let's get him. We don't know which side he took here, but we do know there were lots of assassination attempts. And his hand of the king, he might have been a target. So he might have been on that side of things. Like, he's more likely to be a target than not, probably. Obviously, the main target was Aegon himself. And when Visenya created the King's Guard, I'm guessing Lord Alton was like, yeah, do that. <laughs> and, let, and let one of them guard me. <laughs> After all, Aegon and Visenya... Their version of the revenge tour was taking their dragons down to Dorne and burning every castle except Sunspear, some more than once. So that p- means Alton Celtigar was in charge while they were gone. So he's literally the top of the, the pile while they're in Dorne. So being assassinated is going to be on his mind, probably. And the Kingsguard can't follow Aegon and Visenya because they're on Dragonback. So they're just flying around. There's probably, I doubt, like... There's a Kingsguard just riding around with them. Although that is possible. We have seen that. Um, probably not, though. So Alton Celtigar probably has all the Kingsguard around him and being protected from Dornish assassins. Which gives us an underrated potential connection here. He likely had a big influence on Prince Aenys, later King Aenys, because Aenys was a little boy at this time, and he just lost his mother. His mother was shot down on, you know, Rhaenys was shot down on Meraxes, and... Uh, court was all a buzz and angry about this and he would have been exposed to all that energy and this vibe and him not having a mother that's pretty huge so his dad is gone his aunt visenya is gone hand of the king alton might have just ignored him but decent chance he saw the opportunity to be like this guy's gonna be king one day i should have a relationship with him it's important for my family and for myself like i doubt he ignored the future king even though he was just a, a youngster and if Alton had a daughter or close niece, he might have tried to work that angle in there. Like, maybe my daughter could be princess to a young Aenys here. He could try to, you know, uh, arrange meetings while Aegon and Visenya are off in, in Dorne. Like, my daughter's getting to know Aenys pretty well. Of course, that's not what happened. Aenys married Alyssa Valarian eventually. That was in 22 AC. And by that time, Alton was already dead. Alton died in the year 17 Peace came in the year 13. It's unclear what Lord Alton thought about that. By the way, one of the angles he could have had for arguing for a Celtigar princess was that the faith didn't like incest marriage. It's like, well, you know, I'm still, my house is Valyrian, but you're not, you know, we don't have this whole incest issue. So that's a good way to get around that. Just saying. But it didn't work. So after Alton dies, we don't hear about them for a little while, but they pop up again pretty quickly. After Aenys, uh, Lord Edwell Celtigar was hand of the king for Magor. So another hand. He ruled along with Tiana of Pentos. Tiana of the Tower was her other nickname. While Magor was off fighting the face. So we have another Celtigar hand sort of ruling in place of a king that's off fighting a war. And then, of course, Magor fought his own half-brother, Aegon. So... Edwell presumably was still holding down the fort, the Aegon fort that became the Red Keep. He was the one that suggested polygamy to Magor when Magor was having trouble fathering an heir. He suggested his own daughters <laughs> as well, both of them. He's like, one or both will do. Prunella and Prudence. He's like, hey, they've even got similar names. Why not? And they're nearly the same age, 12 and 13. This guy is creepy. Like, just trying to foist his 12 and 13 year old daughters on a guy who's ultra violent and has already been pretty abusive to his first wife and tried to take a second wife. And uh, I mean, he suggested polygamy, even though Magor had already tried to do that on his own. So it wasn't like a new idea to him, but he was more like suggesting to just do it openly rather than uh, who cares what the faith thinks. (laughs) So, uh, 
the Maesters, and, and Nina points out, the Maesters have noted that young women die are more likely to die in childbirth than ones who have fully matured. Yet they still do this because they're in a hurry and they're trying to hold on to power. They don't to them. What's one woman's life next to holding on to power? You know, they'll just find another woman to impregnate. That's the way they think. So when Magor's reign collapsed, he obviously wasn't king for very long. He, uh, Edwell Celtigar, jumped ship. He's like, okay, I can see this is going badly. Everybody's abandoning Magor. I will too. He left for Claw Isle, where he was a little bit out of reach. I mean, he's not really out of reach for Balerion. But of all the people Magor could punish for jumping ship, why Claw Isle? Again, their relative smallness protects them a little bit here. He might really want to punish Edwell. He might want to make an example of him. But it's difficult. <laughs> it would take him away from the fact that everyone's rebelling against him. He can't jo- fly away to Claw Isle to take care of him while the walls are closing in all around him. So that thing we discussed earlier, Sean, really just perfectly played out here. And I think Edwell knew that. He's like, yeah, I mean, if he comes for me on Balerion, there's not much I can do about it. But I can be pretty sure he won't. Yeah, there's a lot of people closer to him that Balerion could also get to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's other people who are more of a threat to him that might would be more valuable to take out. I didn't even think of this before either, but if he burns down, you know, I don't know, Storm's End or, or you know, Winterfell or any number of other cities or castles, that will be seen and known and spread far and wide. But if he burns down some castle on some island, no one sees it. Yeah. No one knows. There's no horror story. There's no lesson to learn. As it doesn't create the rumor mill or whatever that you would want. That's so. a great point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a, it is more of just a rumor. It's like, really? Did he burn? I heard he burned Claw Isle, but like, I don't know. But when mm-hmm. Aegon burned Harrenhal, the witnesses were, were replaced. Yeah. So many numerous witnesses. Just everyone saw it. Like people, like Lord Stark saw it when he marched his army south. He's like, oh, that wasn't just a rumor. Damn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I surrender. <laughs> Yeah, like seeing it is seeing is believing for a lot of people or, or just to, to see the exact scale or to get the exact proof. So when Mag- Magor didn't make an example out of anyone, everything fell apart so fast. He didn't he didn't take Blarian to do any of that business. He just died on the throne and Jaehaerys came and started setting the realm aright, started conciliating as he did. One of his conciliations was to invite Edwell back. And make him master of coin. And it's a little conflicting in the sources whether it was Rogar who did that or Edwell or whether uh, Jaehaerys himself or whether they just agreed on it. Because Rogar was made hand and Jaehaerys was still technically underage. So, but it's, it's implied or said that it was Jaehaerys' idea to invite Edwell back. And I guess maybe he and Rogar discussed what position to give him. Either way... He was bad at it. (laughs) He went crazy with taxes on the small folk and smaller businesses. This was like, we've all heard of the trickle down economic effect or not. This is like the trickle up effect. He was trying to just (laughs) push the squeeze, the smaller classes so much to force the money upwards, but it was so counterproductive that higher Lords just stopped doing it. They're like, no, the, even we are uncomfortable with taxing the small folk. These people, people who were perfectly fine squeezing the small, but they were like, no, this is so bad that it's screwing up business on our end. Even like even, even us who have no compunctions think this is going too far. So there is a big, so that went badly. And he again proved his scumbaggery by, when a year goes by, it's the year 49 AC, so Jaehaerys is still underage, but uh, only a year, like he's 15, so he's only about a year away from coming of age, I think, if I've got my time right. Close enough either way. He's like, again, he's like, I got my daughters, Prunella and Prudence. Yeah, marriage, yeah, yeah, I know you like Alisande and all, but incest. Come on, bro, don't do that. That didn't happen either. But it did maybe get him a leg up. He got maybe a consolation prize because, you know, he's the conciliator. Consolation? (laughs) I don't know. Is that really? Because both of them were added to become Alisande's companions. So Alisande's ladies in waiting, which is a pretty prestigious spot to be. So both Prudence and Prunella got that. And Prudence actually kind of appears to have been a little bit of a badass. 
in 50 AC, Jerry's comes of age and is like, you know, Lord Edwell, you've done a good job, but it's time for you to go retire. <laughs> <laughs> Three days later, he undoes almost all of those taxes. He was nice about it, but he's like reverses almost everything. Does it all like, nope, none of that. Undo that. Undo this. Undo that. Everybody. So it, it helped actually make Jaharis look like a good guy because because he was so young Everybody was able to kind of not put the blame on him because because of his youth. And then he comes of age. And the first thing one of the first things he does is undoes these tax policies. It really made him look heroic almost. Um, and both of the daughters, Prudence and Prunella, helped disrobe him during the betting. So they were still like right there getting involved. Uh, and in 51 AC, so we'll just we're going like one event a year here, basically was the assassination attempt on Alisanne when those people at John Keel's pool tried to kill her. Prudence stepped up and was one of the big defenders of Alisanne, took a dagger in the shoulder defending Alisanne and got maybe her reward was to get betrothed to Lord Grafton or maybe part of her reward, which was a pretty big get. Remember Gulltown? That's gr the Graftons rule Gulltown. And Gulltown, as we said, is pretty close to claw isle so that's um a regional um, uh someone at their level basically a regional partner someone that they've dealt with a lot they've probably done lots of dealings with the grafton's trade deals back and forth between claw isle and gull town would have been going for hundreds of years even probably predating the celtigars if not it's still hundreds of years uh so i mean that's one of the five true cities in westeros and it might even be closer than king's landing i think it's not but it's it's close so it's it's, it's maybe equal roughly equidistant so the connection i'm gonna suppose that that she did not think of it as a reward okay yeah maybe <laughs> not maybe not she became the lady of Gulltown when she came of age so who knows yeah. but that, that's the prestigious thing um in, and in 55 prunella so three years later became uh lady peak she married lord uther peak which was explicitly stated to be a big win both for prunella and for alisanne because the peaks were one of the biggest houses period at the time which the fact that it's expressed this way shows you roughly where the celtigars were considered and that they're not on that level uh, the fact i mean it was a big win for us uh... For Marjorie to marry Joffrey. That was like, how great for her. The king? The king? <laughs> the king, yeah. So it's typical for the woman's family to pay a dowry, right? That's very usual. And the lower of the station of the daughter, often that's made up for with a larger dowry, for example. Littlefinger, again, the same spoiler chapter from The Winds of Winter, Littlefinger mentions that C Lord Corbray is marrying a merchant's daughter, someone fairly lowborn, at least lowborn by their standards. And in order to pull this off, the dowry was, quote, staggering. <laughs> a little finger called it staggering, because they're basically buying their way into the nobility. And the, and the Corbrays know that, so they're going to charge them out the ass for it. And that's also going to be their money, so they, it's double, they have two reasons to charge a lot for it. And... So the peaks were huge, right? The peaks became were huge at this point. They, their fall came after the Blackfire rebellions, but they're one of the, the biggest houses for the early parts of the, the reign of the Targaryens into, well, up until the point of the later Blackfire rebellions is when they had their fall. Back then they had three castles and it's very unusual to have multiple castles in Westeros. It's just usually just not done because it's too much power in the hands of one lord. So, Probably too much to manage also. You have to have like extra servants and guards and, you know, your your your, your expenses are greatly ramped up. Yeah. And what are you getting from it? You can't live in three castles at the same time. Yeah. So. <laughs> totally. Yeah, you're totally right. So I'm guessing the Celtigars paid a gigantic dowry to the peaks here. That was part of the arrangement. Like, yes, it says it's a big win for Alisanne and Prunella, but it probably came at a pretty high cost. <laughs> the peaks were more than happy to charge the you know like well we'll agree to this marriage but it's gonna cost you and the celtic guards were probably like well we've got chests of rubies <laughs> and uh they didn't have to give up their valyrian steel axe even so prunella was probably the great grandmother or ish great maybe two greats of unwin lord unwin himself which brings a whole new angle to unwin trying to worm his way into the royal family he can say, well, I've got Valyrian blood in my ancestry, too, through the Celtigars. 
which is something that definitely matters. Um, that might be if, if that ever comes up, you know, if that stuff ever hits the screen and they need to get into greater level of detail with these families, uh, he would mention that, <laughs> you would think. Four more years passes in Lord Edwell, who was dismissed in the year 50, as you recall, when Jaehaerys came of age. He died of the Shivers and was the first Lord to die of the Shivers. Remember, the Shivers hit Westeros real hard. It killed young Daenerys and a lot of other lords and ladies besides, I think, Torin Manderley, or, or maybe it was Medric. One of the, Mand the Lord Manderley of that time died. And so did Lord Edwell's son and heir, which was clearly a, a blow. He would have otherwise, Prunella or Prudence would have gotten it, I suppose. But since he had no sons and his daughters married out, it's not clear who became Lord, probably a brother or maybe an uncle. Actually, Prunella or Prudence could have been alive at the beginning of the dance. They would have been, I mean, it's not likely, but it's possible because I think Prunella would have been about like 18 when she married P Lord Peak, and then the dance would have been 80 years later. So she'd been real old, but it's, it's possible. I mean, people do live to be 90s in Westeros. It's, it's not common, but it happens. Uh, but also she might only be like Unwin's grandmother instead of his great grandmother or great grandmother. So yeah, a lot of some wiggle room there. I'd be real curious to see some additional detail. Now, moving on to the Dance of the Dragons, we'll avoid a few of the finer points here for spoiler reasons. It's not, uh, and we'll, because we'll be able to discuss them later when they happen on screen and in Fire and Blood, but just some basics. Lord Celtigar, probably Bartimus Celtigar, because Bartimus is the guy we see on TV. Bartimus becomes Rhaenyra's master of coin. And at that time on TV and in the book, he's a little older. He's on the older side of things. So there's a decent chance he was youngish and was the guy to vote for Lenor at the Great Council. Remember, the TV version of voting for Lenor is voting for Rhaenys. In the book, it was Lenor. She's the, he's the descendant of Rhaenys. So it's, it's the same branch. And of course, voting for the, the narrow sea house, the Valarians, you can see why he took that side, uh, especially over... Um, you know the going against the their neighbors there uh they may have known Eamon personally you know Eamon the the one who was the father to Rhaenys and uh would have maybe had a closer connection to him than perhaps the the Balon branch which it went to meaning uh Viserys and like I said Lord Bartimus became Rhaenyra's master coin uh here is a quote about him Lord Celticar seemed well-suited for the office, staunch and unwavering in his support of the queen. He was unrelenting, incorruptible, and ingenious, all agreed, and very wealthy in the bargain. Another mention of the Celticars being already being very wealthy just keeps coming up, and you can see why. That was generational wealth that they've managed well and kept hidden. <laughs> just keeps coming up. But despite that description, which sounds promising, desperate times call for desperate measure, you can argue, or maybe he just wasn't good at it. But he just started taxing a lot of things that aren't usually taxed. He got creative, but his creativeness was not good. He, like, charged to see executions, which is like, okay, that's not the worst idea ever, you know? But, but the people he was executing were, were debtors <laughs> and people who couldn't pay their taxes. And he also argued for a bastard's tax? Like, what? So, Yeah. Which doesn't necessarily mean that Rainier made a bad choice in choosing him, because this doesn't, like, from that description, it doesn't seem like this is the kind of guy that would do all this. It seems like the power went to his head, or he just, I don't know what, but it didn't look like he would do this. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out on TV, because it might go a little differently. It may not have it run this way. This is obviously book canon, because we haven't seen this version of, of Bartima Celtigar on TV. We have seen him. We just haven't seen it get to that point yet. This is the same guy who urged immediate use of the dragons. She's just like, just go attack King's Landing right now and uh, burn it. That Book and show, he says that. That maybe is your clue that he wasn't going to treat the people with sympathy when taxing them. He's like, I'm just going to, this is another resource to me. These aren't humans. There aren't people in suffering at the other end of this. This is just all about the justice of our cause and nothing else matters, you know? A little too Stannis-y, perhaps. Not, not thinking about the individuals and the suffering. Just thinking about the goal and nothing else matters. Uh, yeah, even the justice of your cause. What what exactly is your cause? Yeah. 
<laughs> are you not supposed to be leading the people or you're yeah. not supposed to destroy the people right yeah, that's like... not really leading them is it <laughs> leading them to their graves yeah <laughs> Like protector of the realm is in that part of the title, you know, like earlier or more than once we pointed out that the Celtic guards have that extra leverage being on an island. They can get away with a little bit more because they're they have a little bit of protection against reprisal, given how hard it is to punish them. This comes up as well in the Dance of the Dragons. When the black faction forms, when the black council forms, which we saw in the end of the season there, the greens get wind of who those lords are and are like, well, let's punish who we can. Well, they can't really punish Clyle. They're like, well, that one's a little out of reach for us. But who's close by that we can get to? So they go for the ones who are on the mainland, right? Like, the, kind of the obvious uh, usual suspects. The, the lords of the Narrow Sea who are not in the Narrow Sea, but on the shores of the Westeros. So, so that's the Greens go after them. And Clyle's like, hey, hey we're, <laughs> we're immune to this <laughs> reprisal for now. And there were some Celtigars involved in the Sunfire incident, which I will leave vague for spoiler purposes, but they were involved in that. So you'll see. Uh, maybe we'll see their badges. Some, mm -hmm. some Celtigars, some red crabs will be, will be uh, present when we see that on TV one way or another. Uh, Blackfire Rebellions. No suggestion of whom they fought for, as it is with many houses. We don't know. There's a lot of houses that just... We have to guess. We, we're not sure, but pretty likely they stayed loyal to the Reds. If there was a if there was the rare rare Keltgar that went the other way, the Black Crab. Ooh, the Black Crab. You're right. Yes, they are the Red Crabs. You're right. Their house already has the right color. Yeah. <laughs> you wonder if they did that on purpose. Red Dragon, mm -hmm. Red Crab. I wonder. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> I mean, crabs are just kind of red. They may have just went for the natural color, but yeah. I mean, they're not red. They're more brownish. But anyway, <laughs> lobsters are more reddish, I guess. But um, I guess some crabs are red. There's those cool, like... Yeah, there's a range. There's a lot of yeah. different types of crabs. That's true. So a couple things here. Th because they're more martial and more financial, they probably stuck with the reds. Because the reds were more about culture and, pol and you know, learning and education. And that was one of the things the, blacks, the, the black dragon didn't like. They were anti. They were like, oh, these guys aren't warriors. You know, they're getting rid of our old, our old martial traditions are being gotten rid of. Think these, these peaceniks, you know, that was, that was kind of their, one of their messages. So on one hand, you could say the Celticars were a lesser house. who could have an opportunity to move up. On the other hand, this, this isn't really their bot. This isn't really their bag, baby. <laughs> Moving up through <laughs> aggressive stuff isn't really how they do it. They move up through the political system. They move up through their wealth and soft power. They're not jumping to the, to send their soldiers off to, for something like this, especially when house the red dragons bases are so close by and they're, they would be risking a lot to, to jump ship quote unquote. <laughs> they're not necessarily even angling and move up. I was thinking about that earlier. Cause I think you refer to them as ambitious, but I feel like they're stable. Yeah. You know? I think maybe like, that's their ambition is to stay stable. Yeah. Their ambition is to keep going what they have. They got a good not thing broke, going. Don't fix it. We're yeah. doing fine here. We're, we don't need to move up. We just don't want to fall down. You yeah. That, you're, you're right. You're right. Maybe that needed some rephrasing or saying a little differently. Their, their ambition is to keep what they have. And maybe, maybe that takes a lot of work, but yeah, they're not trying to move into a riskier venture that could cost everything. Yeah. The more you have, the more you're risking. Like when a person with nothing risks everything, that's why that that frequent movie yeah. cliche, nothing left to lose. Well, the Zeldegars <laughs> have a lot to lose. So, <laughs> like they've, and they've been that way for hundreds of years. They've had a lot to lose for hundreds of years. They're like, we're going to protect what we have here. So, yeah, it seems unlikely they would risk it all to move up a little bit when, when all is so much. Robert's Rebellion is a little simpler, probably. Almost guaranteed they fought for Rhaegar. Right. I mean, Lords of the Narrow Sea, like, why would they fight for Robert? It's almost it's kind of hard to conceive what their angle would be. Like, what's what's their beef here with Rhaegar? Or what's, maybe they just don't like Ares. That would make some kind of sense. But they'd be afraid of him, probably. Like, this guy's burning lords. And how are they going to stand up to that? They're just a small island. I mean, yeah, they got lots of money. But I don't think they could bribe Ares to say no. You know, like, their money's not going to get them out of that scenario. Uh, remember that Rhaegar slew three of Rhaegar's bannerman uh, on the trident. Maybe one of those was Lord Celtigar or a, a knight of House Celtigar. Well, he said bannerman, so that implies the actual lord. So yeah, maybe actual Lord Celtigar was killed on the trident by Jason Malister. Uh, it's probable that there were Celtigar Valarian marriages. We don't know of any Celtigar Targaryen marriages, although it is possible. We don't know of any. Celtigar Valarian seems pretty possible. 
uh, maybe or like Bela Targaryen has Valarian children. Maybe those marry Celtigar. Like multi-level marriages there, uh, or even Reyna's Targaryen Hightower daughters. Or you know, backing up to the Blackfire rebellions, maybe that was an angle for the Celtigars to fight for the Black Dragon after all, because they have connected. They have that ancestry with House Peak, and the Peaks were, you know, the most prominent house amongst the Blackfires, other than the actual Blackfires. So, yeah, it might have been a little bit of like they may have felt the pull, and you know, still I, I would guess they fought for the Reds, but it may have been tempting. Also in Robert's Rebellion, we have the current Lord, who is Lord now, was Lord then. Probably. He's old now, so he was certainly alive then. He would have probably fought in the Rebellion, though he may not have been Lord. Right? He may have been captaining a ship. or He's considered sour and greedy and, of course, wealthy. He may be partly sour because things didn't go so well or because he's lost a lot of wealth backing these guys. Or maybe he's just... Maybe he's just a sour guy. Sour crab sounds bad. Yeah, sour crab. <laughs> it's like that fermented crab and the Davos was selling, right? Mm, in it's clap cloche. <laughs> crab juice. <laughs> <laughs> so, but maybe he's just um, like a... What's the character from Christmas Story? Um, Scrooge. Where you have a man who's... His personality is wrecked by being an inheritor. He's ne- he's got n- no peers. He's got no friends. And he's too his wealth makes him too different and he has embraced it too much and he just has that state of affairs has existed for so long. And he's become a bitter old hermit because he's a hermit crab. A hermit crab. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. What's also funny about this guy is his name is Lord Ardrian aka the Red Crab. Like your sigil's already the red crab. Like he's the red crab. That's like a, a Clegane being the black dog of Clegane. Like they're all black dog. Like, <laughs> the lion of Lan- they're all lion. <laughs> <laughs> the gray dire wolf of Stark. Like yeah. <laughs> like why is he the, the? Okay, so anyway, how are you distinguishing from the others? Yeah. we need more here. No one's done it like him. <laughs> he's the reddest crab. Like, he's the reddest. so red. Yeah, the others are orange by comparison. <laughs> They're pink, like you, Sean. The you would be the pink crab. crab. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, the War of Five Kings. This is where we get a little more detail. We have again Ardrian Celtigar, same guy. Yo, Ardrian. He supports Stannis, but along with his sour nature, he's not enthusiastic about it. He's there when the uh, Seven are burned at the uh, beginning of Clash of Kings. There may have been a time back in Old Valyria when Hal Celtigar was fine with burning the Seven, but <laughs> that time is long past, and it looks a, looks a little dangerous in current times to be going against the main religion. You know, it wouldn't have been such a big deal in Valyria where the Faith of the Seven would have been something kind of obscure or just just some foreign religion that they would make jokes about, for all I know. Depending on your vicinity to Standis or Melisandre, it might be dangerous to go with the Seven. Oh, uh, Yeah. <laughs> Is it that brings me that brings me to another new word there. If you're near Aegon sisters, is that in the vicinity? <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. That was a pity laugh. That was pretty bad. Yeah, that was a pity <laughs> laugh. Yeah, I guess I I guess I'm supposed to. I guess it's like my my as a co host and partner in life, I like have to laugh at that. But, like, but you don't yeah. have to like it. <laughs> it's fine. See, I know that. A bad pun is just an opportunity to make fun of the pun, which that part's fun. Yeah, we as we established, I did a clip of your of Aziz's Kragen Stark pun, and yeah, people liked it. It didn't discourage me. It only made yeah. me think, of, yeah, even the failures can be turned into wins. Mm. Uh, Are bad puns buns? <laughs> <laughs> may as well be. Was that a pity laugh? Did I get a pity laugh? Yeah, yeah that was a real laugh. Well, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. It was a real pity laugh. <laughs> <laughs> It's a real pity that I laughed at that. <laughs> uh, Battle of the Blackwater. Yeah, so Stan- Sir Emery Florin. This was his plan, such as it was. Ten lines of 20 ships each. So that's 200 ships, right? The front three rows were comprised of the Royal Fleet and the war galleys of the Lords of the Narrow Sea. Lords of the Narrow Sea. That would include Lord Celtigar. The wildfire destroys most of the ships on both sides. But the front two lines of those ten lines were far enough upriver to escape the majority of the conflagration, at least temporarily. Some of them were later <laughs> destroyed. But 
Now, some of those ships escaped upriver and are still operating even now. They're like river pirates, even currently messing with Lannister and Tyrell supply lines. That's kind of an underrated little mini storyline that's going on. A few others landed troops and then weren't, weren't able to depart. Some landed troops and then picked troops back up and fled when things went south. But some didn't. And I'm guessing Lord Celtigar's was one of those. Because he was captured. His ship clearly wasn't burned because he was captured. Uh, and he probably didn't escape because he was captured. So his ship was probably one of the ones that evaded, was in the front two lines, so wasn't hit by the wildfire, but was then trapped by the boom chain, unable to get back out, and you had thus had no escape, and clearly didn't become river pirate because he was captured. So, now remember, some of the troop transports landed their uh, troops outside of the chain. So this, of course, could not have been one of these in the case of Lord Celtigar, since uh, it says that the Lords of the Nereshi's warships were all up front. So uh, he may have um, understood what the wrath from Stannis and Sir Axel may have been. He may have perceived his peril. He didn't go back home. He bent the knee to Joffrey and stayed. <laughs> he, so he may have perceived that they were something like that almost happened, happened. He might not have been allowed to go back home either, That's true right? Too, yes. Because uh, it would be easy to like, yeah, I've been to knee. Uh, now I'm going home. Okay, get the ships. We're going back to attack again. Yeah, you know, exactly. So. They, may have, they may have demanded a hostage, but he, he didn't have one. Or he may have been like, no, I'll just stay here instead of, I'll be the hostage. I don't want to put my son or daughter here you know, in place. Or if, if he only had a daughter, they may not have accepted that. Like, oh, that's not good enough. You know, like, oh. Damn it. <laughs> so either way. Do we know that he have a son? Who th- I feel like Stannis references later who the new Celticar is. No, that Am was the Valarian probably. Yeah, the Valarian okay. Lord died. Monford Valarian died. Or one of the Valarians died and the new one is Monford. Yeah, he's a boy. So, yeah. Um, but there are Valarian troops still with Stannis north of the wall, but not Celticar because the Celticar troops bent the knee. Also, there's just not many left. <laughs> um, so, and Ardrian Celtigar was there. Uh, for a couple of important events. He was there at the Purple Wedding. He was there at Tyrion's trial, which probably means he was there for the trial by combat and saw that, because why would he miss that? Like, he's just there hanging out. Why would you miss the trial by combat? It's the thing to do today. So he's probably still there. Uh, It's too bad. He would have probably been a good master of coin for Stannis. He sounds like he's tight-fisted, which that can be a good thing. If you're too tight-fisted, then you're you're in the Scrooge territory, and that's not good, but... You know, we don't want to know another thing, the, uh, the, the, o- too sp- the overspendy guy either. Another thing occurred to me is there could be several other key Saltigar prisoners that were taken, oh, which would yeah. further motivate him to bend the knee to That's keep true. all these other family members and trusted soldiers and advisors from also being killed. You know? That's a good point. Since his ship wasn't burned. Even if he's willing to die, he's not willing to sacrifice all these other people. Yeah, that's a great point. Because since his ship wasn't burned, he probably had a lot of other of his family and close people would have been on that ship since it's like yeah. it's where he is. They would be with him on his big warship or whatever. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about this. La- our last section of called The Secret Wealth of Crabs. So yeah, there's still a wealthy house. Even now, despite the se- severe decline of House Valarian and the fall of House Targaryen outright, uh, if we can summarize why they have so much money, I mean, heck, let's, we didn't even mention the crabs themselves. Like they might make a decent bit of cash just on that business, just crabbing, selling crabs, uh, or taxing those who do under their, you know, on their lands. Um, and that alone, of course, doesn't explain their wealth, but not, no we, one thing will. They're crab fluent. <laughs> crab fluent, crab fluent. <laughs> Obviously, the taxes are still happening Pat from passing ships, most likely. Building ships, perhaps. Maybe they're selling some of that. Uh, but, just, but I cannot underestimate, I cannot understate just how valuable the toll collecting probably is with so many ships passing by to get to, on their way to King's Landing. And the deals you would get on goods that arrive there earlier, you know, things like that. They could also get a lot of value, uh, uh, several other things. Oh. Uh, even if the crabs themselves aren't worth a lot of money, it means they don't have to import food from anywhere else. Yeah, they can self-sustain, yeah. mm, you know? And uh, it also, they're old enough of a house that any investments would have had a long time to come to fruition and pay off and build on themselves. That's um, true. And, and investments also are something that might be 
hard to see, you know, like residual income you get from a business you set up in some other place or free goods you get from someone as payment that, you know, even if it, and it might be goods that get used up like firewood or food or something like that, that you don't have to spend your money on those things. So you get to save your money that you're on and on and on like that. Just having been around for a long time and being self-sufficient coupled with taxes you get to levy, not having been uh, faced great failures in the past, advantages you could have gotten as master of coin in different times in history, like all that stuff. It, it makes sense to me that they would be wealthy without it being apparent. Yeah, and that they would be good at the the things that enable you to do that. Like they would have this savvy comes from isn't just random. They've, like you said, all this experience as master of coin and whatever they had before that whatever money management skills as they passed from son to son or family members to family members within the family. And some of those things are secret. Some of those things are, some of those things that little finger figured out on his own. They've known how to do for a while. He might be better at it because he's so genius, but they would have maybe already been aware of the techniques. And other knowledge and skill that might pass through there. Yeah. In addition to physical goods, it would just make them more efficient at all sorts of endeavors. Tricks and, that uh, rich people do with wealth that we would, not, we can't conceive of because we haven't been on the, front end of owning that much wealth, <laughs> you know, or generational wealth. Also keeping it more spread out in other areas or other investments or companies or on ships that are traveling. Yeah. It, you, all their eggs aren't in the same basket. Yeah. Like if someone did, you know, raid the island and steal their chest of rubies and their Valerian axe, well, they didn't get all the ships that are sailing somewhere else with the chest of rubies and all the continuous uh, lumber they're getting from crack claw point and food they're getting from the crabs. Like they could still sustain themselves, even if they lost that chest of rubies and, and might have chest of rubies sped out in other places. Now, if you recall what happened in house of the dragon, as soon as the, the greens took power, they made a, a very savvy move, which was to seize the treasury and send it in fourths to four different places for safekeeping. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's exactly the kind of play we're talking about. That was a Lannister who made that call. Well, in the book, it's a Lannister who made that call. I think Otto, Otto Hightower may have been the one to point it out in the show. It doesn't really matter because those are both houses that have had generational wealth for uncounted, countless generations. So they're, they're savvy, potentially elite at this kind of thing, at managing massive sums of money. So, yeah. And so all these tricks of the trade, one of them I got to think is just is on the more basic level. Yeah. Hiding it. And I don't just mean hiding it using finance tricks like, portfolios and offshore accounts i mean just literally hiding it like in secret vaults <laughs> and stone caverns and like a chest of rubies hidden in a secret stone cavern could totally restart your entire family if if this this raid happens and they pilfer your whole castle well if they didn't find these couple hidden chests of rubies well boom you're you're not broke after all you know and they they would have this like you said they wouldn't keep all their eggs in one basket They'd be too smart to put it all in one place. They wouldn't invest all in one industry. All these things that they've learned thousands of years ago not to do, and they still do at least somewhat smartly because they have had reason to continue doing it properly by being master coin. They're continuously thrust in money management roles. And yeah, sometimes they did it badly. Like they were, <laughs> there was bad tax policies by some Celtigars, but that's something we alluded to as well. Like, yeah, these things are always going to depend on the inheritance system of firstborn inherits and that comes with it all the perils of well if that person's a dummy then dummy things are going to happen but clearly they've not frittered it all away they haven't had any one lord dumb enough to lose it all or any lady dumb enough to lose it all whatever mistakes they've made they weren't fundamental they weren't critical uh storms or they weren't punished out. for it seems sure. like we talked about a couple leaders it did make some errors but it didn't ruin their house it's know? so easy to think about how they would negotiate this spot they're like look it would be a real pain for you like they would drop the hint that yeah it's a real hard it's a real pain to invade our land but we're willing to negotiate and look we've got all this you just give them some money like they can pay them off like they got all this cash be like look we'll give you this money you give us a pardon we're good right yeah of course I, that's gonna work most of the time because like Anytime they're surrendering, probably a bunch of other houses have surrendered too. They're not the only rebel. They're never going to be the tip of the spear. That's we've been over that enough times. They're never that guy. So they have they have more ability to back out of a, a mistake than most houses because they've got that logistical protection of the being on an island and the money to buy to pay people off. <laughs> Double whammy. That's a lot of cushion right there. Yeah, you can. Mm hmm. 
And you also point out, Sean, uh, this last note here you have about just so many good investments over time, like just adding up. Yeah, that's a great point. You can't steal that, right? <laughs> you can't steal some. It's, well, you can. You kind of can, but not. You don't just steal a trade. But it's deal. more difficult than a chest of rubies. Yeah, it's not like you don't come in with swords and steal that. You, yeah, they can find their. They can take their business elsewhere. <laughs> so let's let's talk about some outlook as we m make our way to the end of this episode. Sir Axel's evil plan to loot and burn Claw Isle. It was co-anchored by Salador San, as as I reminded y'all. What's to stop him from? doing that with someone else just finding some other partner and being like yeah i know they have all that money i'm not beholden to anybody i'm a pirate do it you know he needs all he needs is some some soldiers that can that are in on it maybe the golden company i mean the golden I, company i doubt seller san is actually a good guy at all yeah but i want to think well of him because davos seems to yeah and that's enough to make me think maybe he won't do it maybe he would agree with davos that it would be unfair Sure. To punish the, you know, wives and children of the men that went off to try to fight this cause. I don't know. It could be. He might. He might do it. He might Warren do Waters it. might do it. Or just someone else, right? Someone else that's yeah, aware yeah. of this. Someone else that's figured it out. Someone else at the same staff is like, boy, those claw people probably have a lot of money, you know, or just someone, someone in the know, someone with a fleet. Orion Waters, you know, comes up there, hits them hard. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities. They don't have to worry about the others, at least, but they, <laughs> but they do have to worry <laughs> about pirates or. Someone like that. By the way, don't the Celtigars owe Davos like dinner or something? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like a, 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 a big meal of crabs and onions and all the beer he wants. I mean, oof, that is. <laughs> he did that. So, yeah, as for Lord Celtigar himself, he's still in King's Landing, as far as we know. What is. Uh, he stayed away from going home because maybe he wasn't allowed to. And, you know, maybe he, he, he may not realize how close he came to being burned out by Stannis and Sir Axel. But he's in King's Landing, which could also be blown up. <laughs> it may be his fate to be like, ah, red crab in the red keep. Doesn't go so well. He might just be standing there at the red keep when another teenager shows up. And he could be like, here we go again. And that teenager, of course, I'm referring to is... Uh, Young Griff, Aegon the Sixth, as he could be, and that could that plot line could end in blood and fire, blood or fire, either or, wildfire or regular fire or dragon fire, and yeah, that might give him a leg up though. It's interesting to consider what a Celtic, what this Lord Celtigar would do if coming face to face with Aegon. He's like, hey, we share ancestry, and again, he's like, imagine me helping you. I'm rich. Don't you want me on your side? We have a we have heritage in common. He could offer that, and it would be substantial. I'd be like, yeah, I want you as an ally. That's valuable. Which side he's going to end up on, or will it be sort of the pattern we've been seeing? They'll join. He'll join with Aegon, and then jump ship when the time is right to the stronger newcomer, Daenerys. Or will they stay with Aegon because of Daenerys's? perception they don't like the dothraki or the red priests red priest red crab maybe that'll get along i don't know but i do think it'll be important i think like Aegon, we've talked about how the orane waters may come in contact with danny and how that may go but the celticars and their wealth don't sleep on that that's a big deal whoever they throw their weight behind is going to have a lot more money than they had and that'll make a big difference so i'm guessing they'll end up with danny but they could fight for Aegon for a while first it's kind of where i'm at with it any uh, any other thoughts on that do you all have a any visions for what happens with house celtigar maybe they will just end retreat up into their shell yeah let's just retreat into their shell yeah <laughs> yeah good call <laughs> i i was thinking if if the the lord there at um king's landing who bent the knee does have other allies there that he was trying to protect by bending the knee there could be an insurgency within, you know, depending on how things play out in King's Landing, there could be enough enemies of whoever's in charge at any given moment. Yeah. The right, you know, the right coordination, the right timing, uh, kind of like, isn't it, isn't like Manderly and uh, who, Lady Dustin, yeah. is that her name? There's a lot of people like these personal motives that are in the court of these leaders it could easily usurp whatever plots they have going on you know he's might be in a similar role lady dustin is a great analog here because what is what does theon say 
you know, maybe you. What about you being this? You know, she's like, well, yes, I could be a problem for Roos if he, you know, he could, mm-hmm. if I wanted myself to. That's why he takes care to keep me sweet. So it's the same kind of sentiment. It's like, yes, there are bigger enemies to have than Lady Dustin, but she's important enough that Roos will do what he can to keep her happy and on his, on his side. So it's, the Celticars are in a similar tier, I think. Like, you don't want to lose the Baritan. You don't want to lose Baritan. You don't want to lose Lady Dustin because she could be a big problem. But it's not necessarily going to be the thing that tips the scales. It's not like, oh, God, we've lost now. You know, like if House Valarian were to flip to the greens in the Dance of the Dragons, that would probably just be it. <laughs> right? <laughs> but yeah. um, the Celticars would just be a huge blow. And, and in certain circumstances, they could be the tipping point. But probably not. Right. Case. Like in, in the right time, right place, it could be the tipping point. Yeah. Like if in the middle of a battle, her bannermen suddenly turn on Roos's soldiers, you know, yes. even if they couldn't defeat them on their own. But if they're pinned in some position or, you know, counting on a flank being protected and it doesn't happen, something like that. So. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that we could have imagined that we didn't bring up. There's just, there's when these episodes we do that there's a lot of gaps in the history we can make guesses. For example, there's a lot of times when the Targaryens and or Valarians fought foes like this one on my shirt, the Crab Feeder or Pirates in the Stepstones. The Celticars would have been a part of that. Their navies would have been called on. Their ships would have been part of the squadrons and in positions of honor given their heritage and, and position in the Targaryen hierarchy, which is, I guess we could call them the third place. <laughs> and that's really substantial. They would always be counter. They'd be like... Pos- after at the victory dinner afterwards they'd be at the top of the table you know drinking wine with the targs and Cel- targs and valerians and uh soaking up the the all the good stuff so yeah there's definitely a future for them and i think y'all will now be a little more keyed in to what happens when they come up on page they'll be a little more prominent you'll have a little under, more understanding about their place in the in the world their place in the plot and if other st- when the day comes that other stories are told outside of A Song of Ice and Fire in Westeros, like the Dance of the Dragons, like the Hedge Knight, whatever else comes, you'll have a greater understanding of this one house out of many. It really helps fill things out. It gives you a greater understanding and greater love for the series. Let's talk about the uh, answer to the trivia question. The question was... Um, Wait, what was the question again? <laughs> who created the title Grand Admiral? Oh, yeah. Bonus created. question, who currently holds the title? The creator of the title Grand Admiral is... Cersei? Uh, no, that would be Kirky. <laughs> 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 yes, it's Cersei, yes. It was uh, Cersei. Multiple people guessed that. What's really funny is Cersei created the title Grand Admiral, gave it to Orain Waters. He ran away. Cersei got thrown in jail. Kevin was like... Oh, and she removed Master of Ships, the title Master of Ships from Paxter Redwine, right? And then Kevin takes over and Kevin gives the title of Master of Ships back to Paxter Redwine. But rather than doing away with this new title of Grand Admiral, she just give, he just gives that to Paxter also. Plus, there was already the title Lord Admiral. So Paxter Redwine is Master of Ships, Lord Admiral, and Grand Admiral. <laughs> They're just like, well, we're not going to just throw away this new title. We don't do that. Like, it's too fancy and cool. We got to keep it. Oh, what? Cersei made it. We can't just do it. Yeah. Even though it's exactly the same. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, yeah. So, the current title holder is Paxter Redwine. That answers the second part of the question. Next week, as we... I can't see that being uh, uh, meaningful, by the way. Like, Master Ships could be a little bit more on the mercantile side mm. and you know lord of ships maybe or you know i, I could see some division yeah, of power and responsibility yeah. that's probably even smart you know maybe not grand admiral and lord admiral that sounds like the same thing but <laughs> yeah maybe grand admiral is in charge of the lord admiral and the master ships uh, you know and the I lord think... admiral's in charge of mercantile stuff that would and, make uh, sense but it, it always makes sense to, yeah. to, <laughs> to split power and to have two leaders i mean whoever would we be without the two popes <laughs> <laughs> just ask the kings of england yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Offers reference just in case anyone else. Yeah, I was like, what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah, I'm speaking of a show that, that I'm like picturing that... I'm the this is the this is the Grand Mad- Admiral and this is the co Grand Admiral. <laughs> 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 so we mentioned some other episodes. Uh, oh yeah, next week is Joe Magician coming to talk Duncan Egg, Dreams of Duncan Egg, both the envisioning the show and talking about their dreams. 
his Paul, dreams. His dreams, yes, yeah. just just his. Yeah, we, the poll actually to give you a teaser. It was all dream related, the dream theme as opposed to the dream team, <laughs> and different dream related topics were were picked upon. And of course, given Duncan Egg's, you know, new announcement, it, it, we were unsurprised that it won. It wasn't it wasn't a runaway victory, but it did win handily. If you would like to join the voting, then join us on Patreon. We are still in our sign up for two dollars for the rest of the month until the two dollar level goes away so if you get in in april 2023 you can get in for two dollars two dollars a month and get all those benefits including bonus episodes and uh, access to polls other levels are available for higher dollar amounts to get you access to things like scripts and shout outs and other benefits that we have listed on the website that is patreon.com history of westeros slash history of westeros that is if you wish to support us in another way, you can do so through, say, Spotify as uh, its own subscriber feature. Not as robust, but just as effective. You still get the bonus episodes through that. You can also just go to our website and leave us a one-time donation or even do a recurring donation through PayPal. Some people have set that up. Whatever works for you, we would appreciate. We definitely need to keep the money rolling in to keep this going. We got There's three of us, lots of things we need to cover. And we're here every week just about doing it. All right. So other episodes to keep you in the spirit, in the mood, in the world, keep you immersed. We got House Valarian, one of the more obvious ones. Clans of the Vale. We talked about ancient first men types in the Vale. Uh, the, the, the tribes, a lot of that relates to what we were talking about in Crackclaw Point. Just the old first men vibes and culture. Of course, the Hedge Knight. It's not directly related to the topic today, but it is directly related to our talking about the TV show coming out, the first episode that that has been a news item. Uh, the three of us with occasional guests covered all of the Hedge Knight novellas. Uh, I think it was four episodes each. So we did lots of deep coverage. Those were back in, I think, early 2021. But I will be uh recycling those to the beginning of the early part of the feed so you can find them uh kind of reposted to our uh, podcast feed for our youtube feed well you just got to look for them because we can't really do that on youtube that feature is not available to us so definitely check out any of those if you haven't already or if you are in the mood to try them out again because we make them to be re-listened to just like george makes his show his show his books re-readable Oh, heck, the show is rewatchable too. I want to take every chance I get to plug Harry Lloyd's audio reading of the Hedge Knight series because it was one of my all time favorite media experiences. Nice. Yeah, that's actually a great idea, Sean. If you have read it and you want to go through it again, but want to try a different way, then listen to it. It's a different experience. You know, your brain will pick up things a little differently when there's like dialogue and a person reading. Yeah, it's just our brains all work differently listening versus reading and uh it might be some things might hit differently with this uh with this medium thanks everyone for coming if you watched live we definitely appreciate your presence talking in the chat or just being present for the discussions either one thank you for anyone who supports us whether you do it financially whether you advocate or uh, tell your friends that is very appreciated. You can leave reviews for us on whatever podcast platform you listen on or leave a like on YouTube. Thanks to Nina for her notes. Or say hi to us in person at a con. Yeah, <laughs> that's always great. That's one of the best ones. Thanks to Joey, Jesse, and Brand for the music and video intros we have. Those are so cool and really help identify us. They're part of what identifies us as us you rec those, the, our music and sounds are very history of westeros mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have told us over the years that those songs are just ingrained now we've been been we've been at this for long enough and some of y'all have heard that intro just so many times that it's really just uh it's like pavlov's dog you hear that music mm -hmm. and you're like well here comes some bad puns Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you're already groaning and cringing as soon as you hear the music <laughs> <laughs> thanks as well to michael clarfeld that's a person who doesn't cringe at my puns <laughs> and he makes great maps and i think it's his birthday today yeah it is happy birthday michael aka misha <laughs> michael you are a great man i hope you have a great birthday join us in wishing him a happy birthday Indeed. 
And until next time, everyone, you know what to do. Valar, re-read us.